Welcome to the Safety Doc Podcast with your charismatic host and prominent safety expert, Dr. David Perodin. Be entertained and informed as the Safety Doc discusses both best and bizarre practices in safety preparation and crisis response. The truth will keep you safe. Follow Dr. Perodin on Twitter at SafetyPhD. Hi, everybody. This is David, and welcome to the Safety Doc Podcast, episode number 53, The Anatomy of Panic, Professor Howard Cantrell of Princeton University. So we're going to talk about that, kind of an expansion off of last week's discussion regarding the school district outside of Cleveland, Ohio, that decided to torpedo its eighth grade class trip to Washington, D.C. because of parent fears that there could be a mass shooting or some other type of terrorist attack. Um, So we got into detail about that, and I want to expand upon that um, because... I think it's it's a natural feeling for parents to want to protect their children. Obviously, the most valuable assets in their lives. Um, but we are going down this path of this this hyper protectiveness and this this omnipresent perceived threat, and we need to do something about that because what we're going to do is create a generation of youth who are completely afraid to engage in reconnaissance, not only on a national level. Um, as discussed by Aaron Clary in his book, Reconnaissance Man, um, which you can find on Amazon.com, um, but even on a state level or even on a county level. I mean, this district was 22 miles away from Cleveland, Ohio. So if you're not safe going to Washington, D.C. On a, on a bus trip, then how are you safe going to Cleveland? And my argument is, is you are safe doing either of these you have to understand safe travel, um, and you know that that's that's the keys: teaching safety, teaching awareness of environment. Those are lifelong skills. We have a global economy, a global community. So the youth of today are going to be traveling probably more. Um, they're going to be engaging with different cultures, and just you know, I I want to come back to this because I felt like I didn't do um, probably enough in describing the parent perspective in this and also how the school kind of gets framed into um, a a certain position that they have to take. Like the school can't say, well, we're still going to send the kids over to Washington, D.C. because it's what's good for them in the long run. Uh, Because if anything did happen, even remotely happens in Washington, D.C., when those kids are there, um, the parents are immediately going to jump all over the school on that. So, but before we kind of get into that, and that's that's going to be a little bit into the show, uh, I want to thank my followers. Boy, we had a tremendous viewing and listening of Podcast 52. Uh, the numbers were off the charts, record setting here for the Safety Doc Podcast. So thank you so much. If you're not a follower, please consider following at SafetyPhD on Twitter, at SafetyPhD. You can go to the website, safetyphd.com, and from there you can find all of my blog posts. Every video that I do, I also do a companion blog post. So you can read that, you can subscribe to that, and it, it gives you opportunities also to contact me through email, for example, if you have any questions. Sometimes people do that, which is fun. You know, I like to respond to that and jump in on any discussion threads, whether it be through um, my blog post or whether it be through you know, YouTube, SoundCloud, wherever you might see this, um, and leave reviews on Apple Podcasts. I appreciate that. I want to specifically thank um, the primary supporters of the show. And for those of you watching, okay, so this show is done in video, also done, obviously, in audio. But the signage for the show and kind of the backdrop has changed. So the dumbbell set, the you know, to show off, you know, my massive 50-pound dumbbells and, and you know, all the, the workout stuff has been, has been moved from the back. So um, that is gone. And we also have some new signs. We have the safety dock, which is a metal kind of street sign. The Sprigio sign, be safe, Sprigio, S-P-R-I-G-E-O, Sprigio.com. 
the primary sponsor of the Safety Doc Show, Sprigio.com, the nation's leader in online safety um, and safety reporting for schools, whether it be bullying, whether it be a perceived threat. Um, again, the nation's online leader um, for reporting. The leader in general, online, they're just the leader, Sprigio, Sprigio.com. And we have the 405 Media, the 405 Media out of Los Angeles, California, airing the Safety Doc Show daily at 2 p.m. PST. And if you hang on for another hour, you can listen to the Clary Podcast with Aaron Clary starting at 3 p.m. So the 405media.com has a range of extraordinary podcasters. It's it's basically like a podcast radio station. And um, you can you have a wide variety on the weekends, for example, Larry Roberts and the readily random podcast is is available. So go in and check out the 405 Media podcast blog post. Um, really phenomenal, original, um, exciting content. I'm very very happy to be with the 405 Media uh, for a year now. So so yeah, I've got the signage in the back. You know, I've kind of adjusted the heights. It's a little weird as I watch the monitor right now because everything looks like it's tilted a little bit. Yet, like, I've checked everything with multiple levels, and I know that everything is level. So it's just the lens which is doing this um, on on the webcam is it's giving it kind of a look like it's going downhill a little bit. But I think actually once I, I do this in post-production, everything kind of levels out. It's just kind of this weird feedback thing of I'm like, am I on a sinking, you know, did I hit the iceberg and, and the bow of the, the, the Titanic is going down because it looks like the house is sinking right now. Um, and, yeah, the house is okay as long as is five rooms flood, the whole house is going down. But as long as we don't have that, we are we are okay. Um, but, yeah, uh, so it's, you know, a little bit of a strange effect to look back there. I'm like, hey, that sign's not right, and then I'll go and check it with the level. It's, like, perfectly level. So, um, yeah, I'm, I really like the, the signage and – um, I might do a little bit of tweaking kind of where it's at, you know, just get, get the hang of it. But, um, it is a much, uh, refreshed background and the guitar actually in the background, which you can see a little bit, um, underneath the Sprigio sign, um, was the guitar of my late godfather. Um, so it is just kind of an, uh, a shout out, uh, a subtle shout out to him. Um, just a, a wonderful man, a wonderful man. So um, thank you again to our sponsors. Thank you to you. Hey, the listeners of the Safety Doc Podcast, you are not the typical audience. Um, you're better than the typical audience. You strive to get rid of the rhetoric and to really understand what's going on. Plus, you know, you enjoy the stories and, um, you know, that, that, that I share, but then you want to know what's going on, how to keep yourself safe, how to keep your loved ones safe, and how to cut through all the hype and media hysteria regarding safety. Because you know what? The, I, can, I can pretty much tell you the people, the parents who denied their kids the Washington, D.C. trip, um, the, you know, out of, out of the district close to Cleveland, they're not Safety Doc podcasts listeners. I mean, <laughs> if they were listening to the shows and could go back through the shows, you know, they would they would definitely um, have a different perspective, hopefully. Um, but, yeah, it's it's the thing where there is so much out there for media hype right now in this really weird what what is called a transference dynamic, which I'm going to touch on. Um, and it's nothing new. I mean, it's been around since 1938, the War of the Worlds uh, presentation by um, H.G. Wells. Um, uh, uh, you know... Well, by Orson Welles, adapted by H. from H. G. Wells' War of the Worlds, but um, it is something right now which I think is dangerously influencing um, uh, just Americans in general. So I'm I'm wanting to make sure that when you tune in to me, I'm I'm stripping that stuff away and I'm saying here's what you really need to know. So I'm getting in and, and doing the the work of pulling out the different research articles and perspectives and and. Um, and people have said, and people are contacting me and saying, hey, this is helpful, and I want it to be helpful for you too. So please feel free to contact me. Um, I'd be glad to hear from you. be glad to respond to you on this show. So, hey, let's get going. A um, couple anecdotes. One is, you know, I worked part-time at Menards 
in college when I was going, you know, attending college, I worked part-time at Menards and it was, it was actually the best part-time job I ever had. I loved it. I loved working at Menards. So let's give you a time frame here. So this would have been right around 1992, 93 ish, you know, right around there, um, working at Menards and, and really, uh, so many great, great memories from, from just that part-time experience. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm thinking right now, I've been reading articles about, you know, students who, you know, work their way through, through college and are, are you know, work, work part-time jobs or multiple part-time jobs and, and students who just don't. Um, and, you know, I worked a pretty hefty schedule. I probably worked, you know, between, I don't know, 20 and 25 hours a week. Plus I had like a grad, a, uh, I, I think it's assistantship or whatever they call it, where you were basically assigned to a professor and you had so much of grading of papers to do or prepping of materials or something like that. Um, actually, I had a friend who was assigned to that too. Um, and her name was Amy, probably still is Amy, I'm guessing. And I put a note in a dictionary and um, I, I put, please photocopy pages, you know, like 32 through 190. And then I like put the signature of like the professor she was assigned to. So like, she totally does this. Like she's unhappy. Like, I can't believe what, what in the world is this all about? So she's spending like all day and has to enter the code and copier. It was back in the old days, you know, so, um, and then she, she gives this packet to him and he's like, what, what's the deal with this? <laughs> so yeah, you know, burned up three hours of her, her day. And I think she got me back for that, but so anyway, working at, at Menards, I worked in the plumbing and heating department, which come, came in many times extremely uh, useful for learning basic plumbing. Uh, the heating part, not so much. You know, like I always felt um, a little nervous, like when someone would come in and say, which pipes do I need to put my, you know, wood stove together and vent it out? And I'm like, you know, if I get this wrong, carbon monoxide could get in your house and kill you. So, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of, a lot of nervousness tension with that so we had one guy in the department i forget his name but he was he was like the star at that like that it was that was his splinter skill like he wasn't great at anything else but he was an all-star at putting together like what pipes you need in the black pipes and in certain coatings and stuff like that so you you'd kind of go to him like say hey you know like can you help these people out um, but yeah, I pretty much learned everything in plumbing and I've gotten pretty, pretty useful where I can do, you know, virtually everything that has to do with plumbing, which is, which is really neat. So it's one of those jobs where you learn too, while you're doing the job. So really, um, you know, that, that's something I would encourage, especially for, you know, young kids entering, you know, into college and stuff like that, get into a job where you can also learn some skills that you can then apply to yourself later in life, whether it be carpentry or whether it be plumbing or something like that versus like being a cashier, not going to generalize very well. So um, one of the cool things of working at Menards back then, and and so they, you know, we had our, our desk, our our department desk, and I remember the, the monitor and it had the green, you know, it, it was just a green monochrome monitor. Um, but you could you could see your sales. It was really cool that the way Menards did this. So they had a lot of psychology that went into this back in you know the what was that you know twenty five years ago I was doing this. Um, you could see how your department sales were racking up against the other departments in the store. But not only that, back then and there weren't as many Menards as there are now. But back then they would um, show you, you could click and, and see how your department was doing at that moment compared to the other plumbing and heating departments for all the other Menards, which there might've been, you know, like 30, I don't know. So we were always ranked, you know, like in the top one, two, three, like we were always there. So what a, it was a, it was a cool motivator. And, you know, like looking back at it, you know, now I can see the psychology that, obviously Menards had, you know, behind that, but yeah, I mean, we, we were rocking, like we were the store, like we had a great, great sales team. And, and uh, I, I really loved going to work. Like it was one of those things where you get called in in, in the morning and they'd be like, Hey, can you, can you come earlier and work a little later? And be like, yes, because I love working with all of you. And, and yeah, I, I really liked the job. Um, so it was, 
you'd log it, you'd go on the computer, someone would say, like, I want a 40-gallon direct vent water heater. Be like, okay. So you'd log in, and it would say we'd have, like, eight of them. But that was never accurate. Like, nothing on the computer back then was accurate. You always had to go out to the warehouse and, like, count and check if you had it. Because if it said you had eight, you maybe had two. Um, so you'd have to go to the warehouse, double check the numbers and, and match things up. And, and I just remember it was, it was, yeah, I mean, whatever the computer said you had was completely, now those things are probably, you know, pretty close, if not identical. But back then you always, you, there, you could never write a ticket out for someone and say like, take this up to the cashier and pay for it and then go out back and pick it up because there was a good chance it probably wasn't even back there. Um, so yeah, you'd make, you'd make a track and then you had to climb like on, on the different scaffolding type stuff to like, and move the boxes around to check the skew numbers and things like, I'm glad I did it when I was young. Cause I don't, I don't think I could do it today. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I, w- I was like Tarzan flying around, you know, the different, the different levels, like checking stuff. So, um, so uh, people would come in and, and the standard joke was, Hey, I want to buy a hot water heater. And then you'd be like, Hey, uh, why not buy a water heater? Because like hot water, hot water doesn't need heating. Why do you need to buy a hot water heater? Just get a water heater. And so I think you know that, that came from what Rodney Dangerfield or something like that. Or no, is is or was it Carlin? You know, why do you need a hot water heater? Hot water doesn't need heating. Um, so nothing, nothing is standard. Nothing is standard. Thank you for tuning in to the Safety Doc Podcast with the nation's leading safety expert, Dr. David Perodin, author, radio show host, university instructor, researcher, expert witness, and consultant. Powerful testimonials. Dr. Perodin has a strong reputation as the go-to safety consultant, and he was still able to exceed our expectations. When we went looking for an expert in the field of crisis preparedness and prevention, David was the single person we pursued. Not easy stepping into the touchier subjects of life, but Dr. David pulls it off. Take a listen. Now, back to Dr. David Perodin and the Safety Doc Podcast. And welcome back to the Safety Doc Podcast. So I, I had a coworker, John, and people would come in and they would they would they would bring in like um, like a valve or or something from a piece of plumbing that they had, and they would say like um, you know like this is standard, and then you know your people always say this is standard. It's like nothing is standard. Nothing there is no standard of anything. So, but. Um, they would say like, here's the cartridge that came out of like my bathroom um, faucet. And John, um, who's, who's very meticulous, but John would, would, would look at it and then he'd ask like, his standard question was, well, do you live in a mobile home? Because <laughs> mobile homes typically had the strangest like configurations of cartridges and stuff like that we've ever seen. And usually we carried the parts. I mean, I don't know how much Menards carries in these things now, but we actually carried a lot of this obscure stuff. And I remember specifically, like he, 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 this, this lady came in and showed him and he's like, well, do you live in a mobile home? And she's like, I live in like a $500,000 home that's, you know, 10 years old and whatever. And don't you accuse me of living in a mobile home, young man and all this other stuff. And, um, I, I I just I thought that was funny, but that was the standard thing of like you know if he couldn't match it up, it was well, do you live in a mobile home? Like John, 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 no, 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 no. Let's just let it go. Um, and his unique quality. So John, John was a great guy, but um, he he was able to at the end of the day, you know, you'd get out parking lot would be empty except for the employee vehicles, and he had this ability to like start his vehicle. And it would hit 88 miles per hour almost instantaneously. It's like he started it with the foot on the accelerator all the way down in the car in gear somehow. He'd turn it and zoom like he'd be gone. I, I never saw anything like that in my life. Um, him leaving the parking lot. I mean, it, it was, yeah, it was like the, the flames from the wheels, a big flash, blinding flash, and then all of a sudden the vehicle was gone. And then, you know, Johnson and another, another 
I don't know, another year. He's 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 working at a, Men a Menards in 2088 or something like that. But um, it's just crazy. It's just crazy. So I, I was the featured associate in the Menards Monthly Magazine. Um, so it was a winter edition. And it was actually a pretty cool magazine because Menards had sponsored a lot of vehicles in a ice drag which is basically where they stud the tires on, on race cars and put them out on a frozen lake. I mean, which, you know, today it's still like, what, 57 degrees here in Wisconsin on the 28th of November. Um, so, like, you know, you know, but back then, you know, it used to get cold and freeze. So they had um, this whole, th this thing was really cool, like th this magazine. And then I was the featured, so I had my smock on and a picture and someone wrote a letter in and, and, and just complimented me on helping them find all of the different fittings they needed to configure whatever the hell that they were doing. Um, they were really nice people. I, did, I remember that. They were really nice. And I spent like two hours with them. But, you know, they, I probably sold them like $300, $400 worth of fittings and then, you know, other things that go with it. But um, and then I had to like draw things out as we were going because I'm like, this was, this was just getting like insane. But, uh, but yeah, so uh, I'm, I still have a copy of that somewhere. I still have a copy and I have, you know, my, my moose up hair and, and a mustache and, and things like that. But I, I was good. I was, a, I was good customer service. You know, I help people out. Um, the Menards commercials, the save big money, save big money when you shop Menards. And then they had, they had this guy with white hair, um, and, uh, you know, this, this older guy with, with white hair, and he'd come in and all excited, you know, this week at Price Fister Fawcett's at seventy nine ninety nine. you know, here at Menards. They filmed those commercials in our store. So they would come in and, and set the store up kind of toward the end of the day. So, like, I don't know, it would close at 8 or 9, and then um, they'd already be in, and they'd shut down, you know, like maybe an aisle or something where they were going to film, you know, the, the first part of it. And, um, and it was pretty cool because one time well, it was probably more than once, but I remember they filmed in our department. So, um, you know, we had to spruce things up a little bit and then, you know, they brought in their special lighting and all of this stuff. And as soon as the store closed, you know, and everybody was out, boom, they, they went to work and, and they, they quickly like shot this commercial, like right there in, in our Menards. So, um, it was just kind of cool because like they saturated TV with these commercials, and uh, and then they would also just play the audio like over and over over you know every you know fifteen minutes over the the PA system. But um, so yeah, I'm like I I remember I remember meeting the guy. Although like you know it's like you're not meeting a celebrity. I'm like hey, you're the guy who does the commercials for the store here where I work. But he was a nice guy, you know. And it was it was just it was kind of cool. Um, so Menards also was really great at making you feel valued as an employee, even if you're part-time. And they would send out, I remember um, a few things. One is they sent out this massive beach towel with the, with the Menards logo and then, you know, the, the color scheme of the black and orange and I don't know, whatever it was, red um, and yellow. Yes. And, uh, and they sent this out. And I mean, it was an okay quality beach towel, but it was like huge. So we, I think we still have it. Like, I think when we still take the kids to the beach, we drag this thing out because I mean, basically it like covers half the beach. I mean, um, you know, and nothing vested in it. <laughs> so yeah, we have this giant Menards. We still have it. Yeah. This, this, this huge beach towel from Menards and they would just send it out, you know? And I remember they also sent out like a really high quality replica NASCAR race car that had the Menards logo. And it wasn't, you know, like the little die cast Hot Wheel thing. I mean, it was decent. It was like maybe a six inch vehicle. It came in its little, I mean, it's probably worth something if I would have ever kept it. I have no idea what happened to it. Um, but they always sent you stuff that was a, a step above, like just cheesy junk that someone would send you, like from a company. Um, you know, like, hey, you know, it's like whatever appreciation week. So like, you know, here's, you know, here's a notepad or here's, here's a, you know, a couple pens or, you know, you're, there, there's a jar and it's got different, you know, the place I work seriously had um, a, the school board would bring in a, a jar and fill it with different types of candy. And it wasn't like great candy. It'd be like Tootsie Rolls and Dum Dums and other stuff. And like, hey, you know, appreciation week. So I'm like, 
ooh, like I don't know, I don't know. Just it didn't it didn't do it for me. But the Menard stuff was pretty cool, and and I don't know, I don't really like. I never collected the stuff that they sent to me, but um, I I always liked that they had the right psychology down to to give you the little feeder items um, to always make you feel recognized. Um, so one of my skills, and I, I became well known for this working at Menards. Uh, I would we we go up, you know, you'd have your 10, 15 minute break, go up to the break room. And it overlooked, actually, in this balcony, it overlooked the rest of the store. And they had the newspapers up there, and just the regular newspapers. So I'd take a marker with me, and I would change, I'd modify the headings on the newspaper. So I'd go through, and I would come up with these witty headings, so like by crossing things out or adding words or stuff like that. I mean, nothing inappropriate, but, and people would just love these. Like, some people take them home. And uh, and so I'd go to work, and, and it was just a blast. I, I wish I, I I actually wish I I had some of those things. When I was in college, I did kind of this onion type newspaper thing where I printed it off myself, and I never I have like maybe half of the copies. I I would print I'd bring in dimes, and and print these things off. And uh, literally, it was like a cut and paste, not like a like a computer cut and paste, like cutting pictures out of a newspaper, superimposing, doing narrative and stuff. And it was really popular. Like I, I would take dimes and maybe do like fifty of these things, and then like hand them out, and, and pe- they were gone. Like people loved them. And there's one guy I know, Jim Fermanic, who I played um, sports with my first couple of years in college, who had the entire collection. And uh, but I have no idea where Jim is now. I mean, I some idea where he is, but um, I only cu- I only kept maybe like 75 percent in I, I had a lot of the originals I didn't keep the copies which looked better than the originals um, so but yeah I wish I would have done that because they were pretty funny they were actually they were they were hugely hugely funny so it was like an early version um, and I think that kind of propelled me into my being nominated to run for the president of the the campus, which I'd never really wanted to do. I think I told that story. The the vice president, uh, Todd, wanted to to kind of lead everything, and and I was popular on campus, so um, you know, was kind of using me to 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 get the votes. And I don't know. I was I was I was up for it. I I didn't win. I lost to Mike Adigma, who said he was going to be a doctor. I don't know what he ever turned out to be, but. Um, we had at Menards also, we had um, uh, a coworker. So we played tricks on each other, you know, but a coworker, and, and we had a new name tag made up for her. Um, so, and we put it on her, her smock, and she would leave her smock there. And I forget, her name was Lori. Her name was Lori. But we had her, we had changed to Wheezy. Now, this isn't any racist thing. This doesn't, it, it had nothing, to, I mean, this, this wasn't, she was, was, um, not of color or, or any, any rate, you know, she, she was white, but, you know, cause Wheezy, you think of George Jefferson, but we just, we just came up with this crazy meme. I think it was back like when Weezer, the band was really popular too. So it's kind of like spark this, but so we create this new name tag and, and put it on and like all of us are in on it. Okay. It's just not the old safety doc here. And uh, so she's helping customers through most of her day. And all of a sudden, like toward the afternoon, so she's been working for like five hours. She gets done and someone says, well, thank you very much, Wheezy. And she's like, Wheezy? What are you talking about, Wheezy? And then she looks down her name tag. She's like, ah, you guys, Wheezy. So yes, yes. She was Wheezy for five hours. Wheezy, W-E-E-Z-Y. I think we spell it Wheezy. We also could print up if you were out of um, slips because you'd pull a slip like if you're going to buy a gas grill or something where you had to go out to the warehouse to get it. And um, if you were out of those, you could have those printed up. So you could, and, and actually you could go in and, I mean, and modify the description a little bit. Like you couldn't change the price and things like that because the barcode, all of that was set. But, um, and my assistant manager and I, Jim, we got along really well together. <laughs> we changed um, a couple of them to uh, buy a gas grill and dance with the manager sale. And one lady during checkout after she purchased her grill actually asked when she got to dance with the manager. And it was the checkout uh, person who turned us in to the checkout uh, police 
And then we, we got talked to by, um, Roger, our manager about that, who I don't think was all that, that upset. I think he thought it was funny. Um, but yeah, we had to take those out, but yes, it was pretty cool. Buy a ga- gra- uh, gas grill and dance with the manager sale. Um, so yeah, it, it was just, it was a great place, an absolutely great place to live. And, you know, I still go back to Menards. They're, they're kind of everywhere now and, and they've, they've just become, you know, big and, and, um, I don't know if any of this stuff even happens anymore, but back then, like you think even retail and stuff like that, and you would learn stuff like if plumbing would break down at Menards, which it did the bathroom or something like they didn't call anybody. They're just like, you're from the plumbing department. Okay. Yeah. You and John are going to install two new toilets in this bathroom and we'll just mark it off limits and stuff like that. I'd be like, okay, sure. Um, and we did, you know, so, um, it was just really cool. And I, I bought a, a hibachi that had been marked down in our department. And finally, like our manager is like, I'll mark this thing down to like, what, two bucks, like if you want it. And and this was like the absolute worst hibachi grill, like I can imagine it was ever made. Like it was all like cast. Um, and, and, and so you, you put this thing together. You know, and, and I think I grilled with it like once and then literally like I couldn't use it again. Like it just was fall, fell apart, but I did get this hibachi grill, which I was pretty jazzed. And then everybody's hit me up for discounts. All my, all my neighbors, you know, are like, Hey, like, can you, I've got to buy like this big ticket item. And I know you get, you know, you get like a discount. And I don't know. And you did get a discount 10, 15, 20% or whatever it was on a limited amount, like how much, whatever per year. And I never really bought stuff from there. So yeah, I did remember buying some things and then like my, my neighbors like paying cash. Um, if I bought a couple things, I don't, I have no idea what the hell I even bought for them. I think one might've been a grill. So, um, so yeah. And, uh, Hey, you know, the safety doc here has a little fantasy football update and I'm going to share that right after this break. Thank you for tuning in to the Safety Doc Podcast with the nation's leading safety expert, Dr. David Perodin, author, radio show host, university instructor, researcher, expert witness, and consultant. Powerful testimonials. Dr. Perodin has a strong reputation as the go-to safety consultant, and he was still able to exceed our expectations. When we went looking for an expert in the field of crisis preparedness and prevention, David was the single person we pursued. Not easy stepping into the touchier subjects of life, but Dr. David pulls it off. Take a listen. Now, back to Dr. David Perodin and the Safety Doc Podcast. All right, everybody, and welcome back to the Safety Doc Podcast. It is time for a fantasy football update here from the Safety Doc. I have played in the same fantasy football league for about 20 years with largely the same guys, mostly guys from college. Um, I've had a little turnover, but for the most part, the league is intact. And uh, this past year, I I started uh, in the work league, I mean, which we started. It was the first time ever, so we have we have a work league and um, it's it's kind of funny because it's in Yahoo football. In, in Yahoo sports football, um, it goes back like four to five years. It keeps like your data. And before that, in my early days, we were playing in a, a site called like Sandbox. So unfortunately, like all the early records and all that stuff were, are gone, you know. So um, it's just like the NFL didn't count sacks before, what, like 1982 or whatever. So who knows? But, um, but you know, so I'm in this league, and, and we're putting it together. And uh, my record is uh, um, currently 103 wins and 86 losses, like over the last five years. And I only play like one or two leagues like a year. Okay, that's it. Um, And I also have one championship. So it was um, the 2014-15, you know, with the Super Bowl ending in 15 um, for football. And I won. I was 15-3. and And I... I, I won the league title. It was my second league title. I also won it back, I think, in, in, in 2006. So, um, yeah, no banners hanging from the ceiling here. But it was, that was a pretty that was a pretty cool season um, for me. So, 
Anyway, we have a, we have a guy in our league, a young guy, a young guy. So I'm 46. He's like late 20s, probably. And uh, and you you can go in and you can check how people have done. So my record is 103 and and 86. You know, which I think is pretty respectable. Um, in one championship, his record is is literally like close to this. It's like 700 wins, 200 losses, 13 titles. I'm like, my God, like you play in like 10 leagues a year. And, and, you know, I, I learned a little bit more. Like, he studies the game day weather conditions. So, like, oh, it's, like, misting out in Cleveland, so I'm going to change, like, my lineup. And he subscribes to Fantasy Football. I mean, he's dominating the league. I mean, he knows exactly who to pick up, who to play. Um, so, it is it, – this guy's just – I mean, there's there's no way anybody's going to take him out. I mean, his team is just – he just demolishes everybody, and this is just – He's a good guy. So, like, I don't feel bad about it because it's not like a cash league or anything like that. But I was 2-5 and five in this work league. Um, and I think that kind of surprised people because they're like, you know, 2-5, and five, like you kind of know sports and you played football and stuff like that. I'm like, I don't know what the hell's going on here. So, um, and I had a pretty decent roster, but I am now 6-6. Six and six. So after a 2-5 start, I've gone 4-1 and one to get to 6-6, six and six, and I am a game back of a playoff spot. But the two people ahead of me are both six and six, but they have more points scored than I do, say, of the tiebreakers. So I'm in pretty good space here as long as I continue to win. So just win, baby. Just win. That's the old Raiders mantra. Just win, baby. So my name or my team name is Mr. Me Seeks. So if you have watched Rick and Morty, Mr. Me Seeks, I'm Mr. Me Seeks. Look at me. I am Mr. Me Seeks. Yes, sir. We make a request. The Me Seeks fulfills the fulfills request. And then it stops existing. So the Me Seeks needs to fulfill my request of getting in the playoffs. That's what I'm asking. If, as long as I can get in the playoffs, you know. Um, so um, it's exciting. You know, I'm, I'm back in. I had the number one pick. I, I lost him the first week to injury. I've lost four starters to season-ending in, injuries. So um, a lot of new faces on the roster, you know, having to acclimate people to the way that the me seeks operate. But, again, it's a fun league, no cash, no pressure. My other league, you know, is a cash league, and, um, uh, you know, it it – and we do have some pretty good rivalries going on over over the years. You know, when you play guys like for twenty years. But so yes, the Me Seeks are six and six. We are closing in. I think we control our destiny. If I looked at the way that the um, the schedule is, it, it, if I win out, like I'm I'm definitely guaranteed a playoff spot. But so um, go Me Seeks. Dun, 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 dun. Let's go team. Let's go. All right. All right, so we took 35 minutes to uh, to kind of entertain you, and now we are going to educate you. So um, let's let's talk here about um, a study. It's called um, "Invasion from Mars: The Anatomy of a of a Panic." Um, it was done by Professor Howard Cantrell of Princeton University and his colleagues, who he he's not going to name, but anyway, um, they what they did is after the um, War of the Worlds, um, October 28, 1938, the, when Orson Welles was doing the War of the Worlds on the radio and people were thinking it was real, a lot of people thought it was authentic, he went out and, and interviewed a number of people and then were getting their perspective on what they thought and, and kind of did a study out of that. Now it's a small number of people and there's only so much we can extract from that, but I, I, I want to look at what he gained from anatomy of a panic because I don't think it's that much different than today. And I'm going to talk about how I think something like that could happen today. Um, so anyway, Eddie, I, as I said earlier, I want to expand upon podcast 52, the, the previous podcast I did. I felt that parents in a school district near Cleveland, you know, made a collectively poor decision by asking school administration to cancel that eighth grade trip to Washington, D.C. Um, because of fears of a mass shooting or terror attack. So putting in th this in a context, so this is this is done in late November. You know, the parents come forward, let's cancel this trip. And so October 1st, you have the Vegas shooting of what, that kills 58 people. And then um, you have, following that in Manhattan, the uh, person who jumps the 
the uh, on, onto the walkway, bikeway, and, and kills eight people in a vehicle as a terrorist act. And uh, and then you know Sutherland um, Springs, you know the the mass shooting at the church, you know happens. So all of all of these things really in about six weeks are are happening on a national scene, both um, small town, but you know uh, in a big city too. And you you have this this kind of grinding in the background too of like North Korea, and you know obviously Washington D.C. is going to be a, a terrorist threat for anyone wanting to do terrorism because if you can bring terror to the to the nation's uh, capital, I mean you're going to gr- draw the attention and and um, you know that's why it was targeted during uh, 9/11, you know, along with Washington D.C. So. Um, you know, I'm I'm a parent. I'm a parent. I have two daughters, and I recognize that children are the most valuable assets to to parents. So, a compelling sense of protection is natural. Um, after the Sandy Hook shooting, my daughter was a first grader at the time, and of course, it was first graders who were uh, massacred by Adam Lanza. You know, for the most part, first graders. And uh, I remember going to to work the next day. Or I don't, you know, the the next the next workday, and and just watching that odometer turn, you know, as I'm eight miles away, nine miles away, ten miles away, thinking if anything happened at her school, like if someone just saw this and thought they could replicate it, some loony person out there who's trying to set a record for you know fatalities by by some crazy act, um, you know, could I get back to her school and protect her? So I had that feeling too, you know. I, I reasoned out of it, knowing that that was very, very unlikely to to happen. And in the event of something like that, most of those incidents are done in eight minutes anyway. If it's like a school attack, and there's nothing I'd be able to do. But um, so anyway, how? It, okay, so I'm a parent. You know, I, I recognize that the you know your children are your your, your most valuable assets. So that compelling uh, need for protection is is there all the time. However, when such protective measures create a mini verse, okay, a mini verse. So we talk about universe, but mini verse, mini verse, like trying to control that, that hover parent, everything that your child is doing and protect, you know, almost this bubble around them. Youth are provided a negatively skewed perception that the nation, the nation, not just the, not the world anymore. Not like back when I grew up with it, it was like the Soviets were going to bomb us, okay? Not, not back then or when my mom grew up and it was like Germany is going to fly bombers over the u.s um no now it's it's that the nation is always on the cusp of some type of attack so no matter where you go but especially if you go to dc um or new york or something like that it's it's just going to be a high risk any moment you're going to get attacked um so people people tend to double down when they're afraid, and, and, and we're going to talk about this study from um, Howard Control from Princeton University that was done back in 1938 that, that proves this point also. But people tend to double down when they're afraid. I saw this firsthand as an administrator, when as a school administrator, and um, after the um, Sandy Hook shootings. So, um, you know, People had very visceral feelings. They would, they were coming out. Parents were coming out. Community members coming out, and they're saying, "We want to fortify the schools. We want stronger entrances. You know, we with double doors and bulletproof glass, and everybody has to be buzzed in, and this and that and this and and so forth. And and literally, we're willing to pay millions in referendum dollars to do these things without a blink. And the reality, and we've talked about this before on the show, if you harden one target, you soften another. So maybe." you do harden those targets and you do create some protection. Although like, I'm pretty sure I could get into any school building in America um, without much hassle. I mean, just knowing, you know, knowing how that works, um, you know, of, of any, anyway, I'm not going to get into that, but, but knowing those, those systems, there's a lot of ways to work around that. But what happens to the kids who are getting off the bus and walking to the school you know, and someone speeds up with a car and can and can take out people or, or like a bus stop or something like that. You know, you have hardened targets and softened targets, so you move people to softened targets. Or playgrounds is another example. And not to make this morbid and all of this, but um, people do not want to hear the empirical science of saying, you know what, you know, that did happen at Sandy Hook, but the odds of something like that happening in a school are once every 13,000 years. 
at any individual school, and you're much more likely to get hit by lightning than you know your child getting hit by, by lightning than something like this. But but nobody nobody cares about that. They, you can come out as an administrator with the best data and and bring in the researchers and 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 put that out there. And I've and I've been at board meetings before where I've been contracted by districts to come in and help them work with their safety programs. And I've been at board meetings when they kind of present, like, here's the work we did with Dr. Prode and so forth. And uh, always a board member or two will say, yeah, but, like, this could still happen at our school. And I'm like, well, yeah, it could. I mean, I can't tell you that it can't. And it doesn't mean also that a meteor couldn't come down and hit your school, you know, that a tornado couldn't wipe out your school. I mean, I can't tell you that this cannot happen at your school. I can tell you the measures that we've worked on, you know, with your school district consulting me on threat assessment and some other things and and, and drill efficacy and whatever um, will decrease your likelihood of this, especially your threat input system like at Sprigio.com. But yeah, you know, like I, I I can't I can't say that. I can't say that to you. And that's what they want. Like they totally double down on this. They're afraid and and if you keep somebody safe and it's like, well, we're just not going to let the kids out of here that, you know, we're not going to let them travel. We're not going to do this. We're not going to do this. And, and the parents, you know, the community is coming forward and, and it's like, we will fortify ourselves. Like we'll be our, our own fortification. Um, and you can't get through that. You just cannot break through that. People do not want to listen to anything that's empirical research. It's visceral. It's what they hear on TV. It's what they're seeing from, you know, Dr. Phil or whoever is, is you know, or, or just the, the regular nightly local news folks, which I get so sick and tired of every time there's a shooting and they visit a shooting that occurs in a completely different state and in a completely different circumstance. And they go to a local district and they're like, well, what would you do if that happened here? And of course, somebody answers that question, like which you should never do, because, I mean, the context and situation is different. Like you cannot transpose what happened there to here because and, and plus you never know all the details like the Sandy Hook details, the hundreds of pages of details as far as like written documents, video, all of that came out, um, what, about 18 months to two years afterwards. That's the stuff you have to look at and kind of make your, your decisions based upon that, you know, if you're going to make uh, systemic change to get better. Um, but, yeah, it, it, it just it's really crazy. So an interesting statistical takeaway. So we talked about that district outside of Cleveland, um, and they were – the the parents nixed that trip to Washington D.C. Anyway, um, I was I, I did some research and the possibility of perishing in a bus accident via the trip to and from Washington D.C. is 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 approximately the same as perishing because you were a victim of an attack. You know, whether it be a, a mass shooting or, or some other terrorism attack. So so you were at about the same risk level for being in a bus accident, not a bus accident where someone like intentionally crashes into a bus or, or something like that, but just like, you know, bus accident, bus goes off the road and, you know, some students are, are, are killed. Um, but that risk of just taking that trip out there and back by bus had the same amount of of threat level, or risk level, I should say, risk level for for fatality as actually being out there on the trip. Um, I did that. I actually ran these these stats. I pulled up these stats and, and I ran them. So, but yeah, like, but who who cares? I mean, nobody really cares. And and the other part is like, and both of those um, pale in comparison to being struck by lightning. Like, you're more likely to be th- struck by lightning to have either of those things happen, but. But it, people, it, do, it doesn't matter. People don't care. Parents, again, they're going to double down on you. They're going to triple down, quadruple down, cinco down, ocho down, nueve down. Like everything is down. Like they will back that position of no, it's not safe. It's a nasty place. I have, and again, like Washington, D.C. is highly, highly patrolled. Um, it's very, very safe for tourists. Um, a ton of surveillance, a ton of police. And there are, and I, I put this in in the blog post too. I mean, there are numerous um, agencies you can connect with if you're a school district that help you facilitate the trip. There are online resources of saying, "Hey, your class is interested in taking a trip to Washington D.C. Here's things to do. Here's places to go. Here's places to stay." And 
and all of that. And and every day, like there are hundreds of, and if not thousands of students who go, and and just thousands and thousands of people visiting, um, you know the, you know the mall where you know the 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 memorials are. So no, you know of of course you know D.C. is is a higher profile area, but um, think about what kids obtain from that. Think about what kids obtain from that. So it, it's really sad because again, you are so looking looking deep into the anatomy of panic, you know, and um, you know those parents thwarting that that trip, you know, what they had in their minds in the last six weeks prior to making that decision was the Vegas shooting. So you know that's in their mind. The Manhattan bike walkway attack by a vehicle. The Sutherland Springs attack, and then this ongoing saber rattling with North Korea. Like we we can launch a ballistic missile, and where are they going to launch it? Well, of course they're going to launch it, Washington D.C. or New York. I mean, it's one of those two, or else Los Angeles. I mean, it's going to be one of you know one of the three, depending on what they're going to do. Or, but I mean, it, it's like, you know, you can perpetually be be in fear, be afraid of these these things, and and it's just it's no no you're creating you, you want your kids to be able to to experience these things and there's so much educational component to that and then also just the ability to do reconnaissance later in life because you freak these kids out on reconnaissance right now like these kids i mean some of them will be like yeah whatever like you know 18 19, i'm gonna do what i'm gonna do but there's a fair number of these kids now who are like there's no way i am going to take four weeks in summer and you know go through the southwest and and you know colorado and and you know learn these different areas and where i might want to go to school and where i might want to work and where i might want to live and things like that because the world's a horrible place and america's dangerous you know that's that's the image so hey so in in world war ii my mom it was a child during world war ii She's still alive, you know, so, and, and she remembers the air raid drills. So this is in like central Wisconsin, remembers the air raid drills. So, and getting under her desk in school and then also the blackouts at night. So they do the air raid siren and then the, uh, you, you'd have to turn off all the lights and any candles or whatever. I mean, I think they had electricity back then, but, um, and people walking up and down in civil patrol, like the, the, the roads and you'd get sighted, like if you didn't have everything blacked out. And what they would say is, you know, there's German bombers that can come in from, you know, uh, bombing aircraft can come in over Canada and into Wisconsin. And Wisconsin actually had the largest munitions factory right outside of like Baraboo. You might remember Baraboo, Baraboo Circus, Ringling Brothers, and then Sauk City, but Baraboo um, were bluffs there. But they, they just kind of dismantled all of that within the last like 10, 15 years. But it's just massive. I think it was, it was active like through the Vietnam War. But, um, but yeah, I mean, but they still lived her, you know, her brother and her sisters still lived their lives and her parents. I mean, they they still did everything that they they needed to do. And I mean, for them going to neighboring communities which were a little bit larger, um, you know, that that was you know, that that took a while to get there and it took a while to get back. So I mean, it's kind of like the equivalent of of going uh you know, by bus eight hours to DC and eight hours back, but, but they just live their lives as is people like during world war two, like the British, um, you know, they'd be, they would be bombed. They'd be hammered by the Luftwaffe and then they would get out and, you know, they move the bricks aside and they would get to their daily business. I mean, that's just the way that it was. Um, so anyway, let's get into uh, invasion of a panic. The study by professor Howard control, you know, the study is a little thin, it gets probably a little more accolades than it should, but um, let's talk about it. So on October 28th, 1938, many Americans believed there were, uh, that they were being invaded by Martians. This was the result of a Halloween stunt orchestrated by Orson Welles. Thanks, Orson Welles, for terrifying everybody. This is pretty clever, actually. In which he adapted H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds to the radio and broadcast the play as though it was actually happening, Okay. So you've, you've heard about this. You've obviously heard about this. So it is estimated that of the 6 million people who heard the broadcast, fully 1.7 million thought it was news. So they're listening to this, and they're like, this is actually happening. Like, there's aliens, like, that have landed and whatever, and, and they're just, you know, he's describing, you know, these special, you know, craft and, and things like that. And, and so people are believing this, that it wasn't a play, it's actually news. 
and and 1.2 million people were frightened you know and again i don't know what the population was back in 1938 but i mean you know, so this is a pretty substantial amount of people in the United States. Uh, a few even bought train tickets or drove off in the opposite direction to New York, the supposed epicenter of the alien invasion. So people are like taken off. They're like, I don't want to be any part of this. Like, I'm, if New York's being invaded, I'm out of here. Um, for Professor Howard Cantrell of Princeton, Princeton University and colleagues, this provided the perfect opportunity to investigate the anatomy of panic. Um, shortly after the event, he interviewed 135 people in New Jersey. So right here. Let's stop right here. So he interviews 135 people. So that's a small end size or small population size. That's not very many people. So and and they're from New Jersey. So you have like a localized area that you're interviewing. So you can only pull so much out of this. It's like relational at best. It's not correlational. It's relational. Um, but on the other hand, he has the benefit when he's doing this of the minimal influence of the forgetting curve meaning like we forget in an hour after we do something we forget 50 percent of it that's natural that's natural for all of us because there's a lot of stuff we don't have to remember as we walk down the street like every single person that we passed um things that might have been on the ground and stuff like that it's just it's irrelevant to, to what our mission is to get from point a to point b so that is something that plagues a lot of research so even though it's a small n number that he's using here He's benefiting from not having to deal with this forgetting curve and also not having to deal with conflation as much, you know, where people are telling the story over and over again and mixing up with previous events. So um, he's trying to figure out and understand how people reacted and might have uh, what might have affected how they reacted. And broadly, he found people were categorized in four ways. So let's go through those first. Those who rejected the Martian story from internal evidence. Um, people who question the stories claim that military units had arrived as rapidly as report. People are like, yeah, this is, come on, this is, this is just not happening. Um, you know, they're, they're like, we know it takes the military a long time to, to, to mobilize for something like this, that there would be, you know, much more of an international response to this and everything. So they're like, it's, they're like this is, yeah, this isn't true. Um, the second group was those who checked up on the story and found it was false. So people who turn to like other stations and be like, Oh my goodness, like what is ABC radio or what is like NBC radio or whatever have to say about this. And they're like, they're not covering it all. You know, I, I don't know what this was on, but you know, so the other radio stations aren't covering this at all. So they're like, ah, and they found no panicking voices and, and nothing really like crazy going on, you know, too much in their towns and stuff like that. So they're like, yeah, this is false. You know, and um, there were those who unsuccessfully checked the story, so people who tried to verify the story. But back then, I mean, there's not a lot you could do. I mean, you could call some friends and say, are you listening to the whatever? And they're like, oh, yeah. Or like, are you seeing this? Or they could, I mean, but there wasn't a lot you could do to confirm. It's not like you could get on the Internet like today and, and, and get the information right away. So, and those who made no attempt to check the story, and this is very important, those who just like took it at face value, of this is what I'm being told, and this is what's actually happened, and this is the truth, and that's all there is to it. So the most surprising category of people are those who failed to check the broadcast. Cantrell found that those who fell into this category were also those who were most fearful. And we see this in schools and like this field trip, like parents who aren't getting information or that empirical evidence of saying, you know, the odds of something like this happening to your child um, – of being the victim of a of terrorism attack in Washington D.C., you know, are are minuscule. Not that it couldn't happen, and it could happen anywhere, but compared to like a lightning strike, or even like compared to like um, being a fatality on, in a bus accident, it, it, it's comparable to that. Very, very, very slim. So, but it's people who made no check, no no attempt to check the story. The most surprising category is people fell to check the broadcast. Control found that these people fell. Um, they, again, they're most fearful. They're the people fearful. These are your double down people. Like they're completely fearful. You know, back in war, the worlds are grabbing their guns. They're getting ready for that goofy alien thing to like walk over the hill and, and be in their neighborhood. So these are the people that are flooding the police lines with reports. And they're actually saying things like, I'm seeing this Martian spacecraft like it's walking i can see it you know it, it's like half a mile away and i can see like the laser beams or the beams it's shooting out and, you know none of this is happening this is all fabricated but because they've been told this they're doing this thing and i've talked about this before called projected benchmarking and that's like um 
you know, the, the, the I talked about this after the Vegas shooting. You know, Vegas shooting happens in Vegas. And then, like, the local news here in Madison will interview people, like, with schools and say, well, what if this happened here? I'm like, it didn't happen here. Like, it's totally different. Like, we don't have the high-raised buildings. This was a concert at 20,000 people. It's high density. You cannot project benchmark and, and do these. Everything is unique. And that's why when I talked about Podcast 52 and talked about Cleveland as as being 22 miles away from where this district was, I didn't want to get into comparing Cleveland to Washington, D.C. because, you know, everything's a unique environment. So let, let, let's kind of roll through the end of this. So probably the most interesting results from the research were the stories people told about how they interpreted the invasion. One very religious woman saw the invasion as divine retribution against what she perceived as a disgusting and morally corrupt society. Meanwhile, a student at Princeton University, despite his intelligence and education, was convinced it was possible for the authority figures in the broadcast to have lied. And as a result, um, he accepted every word. So he's a college student. So, you know, we're thinking intellectual, you know, processing that he's, that he's going through this. But he's like, no, like this is probably really happening. And the government is, is, is you know, ultimately covering this this up. And then, you know, so he's he's accepting. He's, he's totally bought into this. He's totally bought into this. Um, so it, 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 in some aspect, I mean, if you if you contextualize it to 1938, what was it? yeah, 1930, you know, so you, you have a time pre-war where people are very much trusting the government. You have very intense propaganda coming out, um, you know, that you have to, to believe in the government. This was even like Dr. Seuss was involved in this. So, yeah, I mean, you get this university student who's like, you know, yeah, like th- this is actually happening. And, and now, you know, the... Um, it, it, it's just crazy. It's just crazy. So I, I, this goes into what I refer to as a transference dynamic. I've talked about this before in the lessons of lower Manhattan, but it's where right now parents growing up in, in, so of these eighth grade youth, so let's say parents who are like in their early thirties, you know, late twenties, early thirties, they grew up in the area era of cable news and the area of believing the cable news back when the cable news had, some credibility to it that you could turn into the cable news and, and believe what was going on, um, which isn't the way it is today. I go to podcast to in, in Drudge Report to get my information. Um, but but these are people who were trained, a lot of them, you know, to zap on the cable news network and, and this is where they would get their information. They didn't challenge it. Like that's what it was. And it was also before, you know, kind of smartphones and checking in, but it's like you get the one source and you go with it. You do not cross check your sources against other sources. And research is called a kind of member checking when you do research. You kind of like run your research data across other researchers and have them give you feedback on it. Um, and maybe look at some of your numbers and things like that. And, and, but no, none of this is happening. Like you get the one source and you go with it. So all this sparks the question of whether this trick would work today. So that War of the Worlds trick from 1938. The temptation is to think that people are more hardened and cynical to this sort of media manipulation. We're all used to questioning the truth in quotes as it is presented to us. Um, we are all used to questioning the truth. as I, I don't believe that. I don't believe that. I don't believe we question the truth. Some of us, um, yes. Some of us just completely deny the truth, but I think questioning the truth means you get into some kind of debate um, mode. And when you get into debate, debate is really understanding the other person's perspective or the other side's perspective. So you're doing some research into like, where are they getting their data from? What are they basing their argument on? Um, so that gets a little bit deeper. So I, I'm not sh- fully sold on that statement. We also have many more channels of information to go on. It's not just radio nowadays, it's TV and the internet. Well, obviously, like you can, you can triangulate your information pretty damn quick on what was happening on 9-11. You know, the information was coming out by text and also by media, but people could triangulate that really, really quickly on 9-11 as you could do now. Um, And probably more so on 9-11. I mean, now you, you can, you can even get things like if something is happening, um, people can periscope it out and, and give you live feeds and stuff like that. So the question here, could you ever convince a substantial group of people we were about to be invaded by some foreign power? So that, that, that's, that's a question, you know, that's kind of posed here. Um, and my answer is, yeah, sure. You could, you could easily do that. 
Um, and I don't think it would take a lot of people. Would, you know, take a number of, of, of skilled people, I mean, maybe five or ten, you could put some Periscope YouTube videos together to make it seem like this was in the moment developing um, with the way that you could create some things in, in video, you know, to, to make it look like there was being an attack, for example, like a missile launch from North Korea or that there was a meteorite, a meteoroid that was just detected and is bearing down on Earth. And collision was only an hour away, and that you you know you had some stuff that you would post and you'd interview some people, um, and and you could totally present this as being credible, and you could also say like the government's going to try to deny this because there's nothing that they can do about it, or they're going to try to you know you know rapidly put something together, and, and they don't want to panic people, and and people are going to subscribe to this. They're going to be like, yeah, yeah, this is totally like what's going on. Or it's so it's going to take a good 20 to 30 minutes to verify if someone was really organized and the fake news articles coming out. We saw those. They, they worked their way through the media so fast and they, and they did this right after the um, Vegas shooting, too. But they worked their way out. So if you have those ready to go, like you could do, I'm pretty sure you could pull the wool over the world's eyes and at least the country's eyes, the United States eyes. For a solid 20 to 30 minutes before anybody would ever know it. Um, and again, here's the part. If you can get at least like one credible source to validate it or to, or, or to say like, you know, th- th- this could be happening, then you've got instant conspiracy theory on your hands and some instant credibility, which is going to extend that out. So you have like a, a congressperson or, you know, a very prominent reporter or, um, you know, someone in Congress or something like that saying, you know, I can't comment at this time, like we have to verify. But then but then what they do is they take it the step further, is they won't say that. They'll be asked the question of, well, does the United States have a plan to intercept, like, you know, meteoroids if they are, you know, detected? We only have hours. And, and, if, and now you've changed the narrative to, well, Yes, I mean we do have we do have measures and and we do have top intelligence and and we can convene, um, you know our 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 top specialists are from around the world, you know within minutes to um, you know utilize our resources to best address these. Things. I mean, so so you can get totally crazy with these things, totally totally crazy. And I mean, I've there's been some things that have come out like about like um, is Yellowstone going to erupt? Is Yellowstone going to erupt because of you know, the 2,800 earthquakes there in the last year, which isn't like a record, but it's like a lot. And there are some indications that, yeah, you know, th- this could possibly be hap- be happening at some point. Um, it's still, you know, it's like really unlikely, but at some point, I mean, like well. Probably not in our generation or generation or whatever, but, but but you know it's cyclic, cyclical, you know, so it's like every 600,000 years or whatever, you're going to get to a point where, you know, you're going to have this massive eruption. So, um, but if someone came out and they 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 have this organized effort and they're starting to say, like, we've, we've measured these earthquakes, like, we're seeing this, we're seeing this, we're seeing this, we're seeing this, they do some periscope thing and they're showing some steam and whatever and, and, and they just inundate people, um... You you would get a few scientists to jump on saying this could be it like this could be it, and and you would have some mass hysteria. You'd have people running to stores like buying everything up that they had, um, you know, tarping up their their you know windows and 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 you know things like that, um, trying to drive as, as far away from from the area as they could. I'm totally convinced this would happen. So that's the frightening part is people. Um, do not triangulate data anymore. They, they, they don't, and they're they're used to this transference dynamic. Um, the transference dynamic at nine eleven was the um, was you know the average person was about forty years old who was rescued five hundred thousand people from Lower Manhattan by boat on nine eleven, and their transference dynamic was they were raised during the Cold War, so they were trained to believe. Um, you know, through the through the media, through Ronald Reagan, um, Star Wars Defense Initiative, um, popular culture such as um, 99 Red Balloons by Nina, Sting, I hope the children, I hope the Russians love their children too, and so forth. Like, you, you just believe in, in the military. The military will protect you from Russia. Okay, so like when 9-11 happens and you see a harbor 
and you see some military Coast Guard and a few military boats. I mean, mostly Coast Guard, though. I mean, and, and again, most of this was also done by by tugs. But you see enough that you're convinced that this is a military rescue. You've been attacked by, um, you know, a, a foreign enemy, and then your transference dynamic is to trust the military to rescue you. This is a military operation as well. You perceive it. And that's why it was largely orderly and why people got rescued. And now you're seeing the, this whole kind of shift into, I, I think, these, these, these parents of these, these eighth graders who were just, you know, they, they would go to the, the CNNs of, of, the, of the world, and, and that's where they were getting their, their media and their news. And they weren't fact-checking anywhere else because, really, you didn't back then. I mean, you didn't have the Internet. And even now, I mean, it's going to take more – it's diff- it's additional steps to go in and to tra- triangulate. It's a hell of a lot easier to just believe what you're being told through the media, um, and th- and and then you also have multiple events that are happening that are reported out, such as you know, well, Sutherland Springs, you know, in Vegas, you know, substantial and um, and not that you know the Manhattan. Um, you know, killings, you know, weren't substantial, but I mean, we're talking eight people versus what, 28 and, and 58. But um, not all of these things would get reported out. And, and and when they would get reported out in the past, they would get reported out for like a day or two and then it'd be gone. So it, it creates this whole thing of, of, in a, of a hyper vigilance of, of parents. And then also this perception that like, this is just on, going nonstop, like accelerating, and then a wanting to pull their kids closer. So um, so the question comes up, you know, could this happen today, like this whole war of the worlds? Like, could you convince people today? And it's already happened. Like, look at the Cleveland parent, uh, the, the parents outside of Cleveland, what they've done. So it 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 does. It happens. It happens. And it's it's tragic. It's scary. I don't know. Um, if it's going to change, um, because I mean, people are going to have to fact check. And, and the thing is like, you, you have to know where to fact check. Thank you for tuning in to the safety doc podcast with the nation's leading safety expert, Dr. David Perodin, author, radio show host, university instructor, researcher, expert witness, and consultant. Powerful testimonials. Dr. Perodin has a strong reputation as the go to safety consultant, and he was still able to exceed our expectations. When we went looking for an expert in the field of crisis preparedness and prevention, David was the single person we pursued. Not easy stepping into the touchier subjects of life, but Dr. David pulls it off. Take a listen. Now, Back to Dr. David Perodin and the Safety Doc Podcast. I mean, I've got some papers here which are being difficult. You have to know where to fact check. So, I mean, um, I go to, you know, like I go to Drudge. I'm not alt-right, but, you know, and I do, I mean, and, Obviously, listening to podcasts is is not real time, in most cases, unless you're doing Periscope. But um, you have to know where to cross reference your your information to cross reference your information, and you you can do that. I mean, you, you you can definitely do that today. And if you can get a couple sources um, that that align with your position, but in most cases. Um, and, and you have to have an open mind with this too. That's the hardest part, you know, that is frustrating for me with the parents of this district outside of Cleveland, which denied this trip to the eighth grade students, um, of saying, you know, well, Washington DC could be a, a terrorism target. Well, it is a terrorism target. We know that as, in, as is New York and Chicago and Los Angeles and whatever. Um, but like this is our nation's capital is is highly policed it's very safe it, they they expect tourism um you can have a very safe tourism experience and it doesn't mean that then that is any more dangerous for example than what that 
that child or young adult or adult is going to encounter at any other point in their life going to a Cleveland baseball game or football game or even a shopping mall or wherever or just being on the highway and having someone um, pass in road rage. Like where I live, we had a road rage incident um, where a, a wife was killed. I mean, um, it was no more than 20 miles from here. It's probably less on the interstate. You know, I live on the interstate. And uh, it was like two years ago. And her and her husband and kids were driving and somebody cut him off. And I don't know what the whole deal was. And I, I think he was like a federal agent. I mean, it was really wild. Um, and so this person opens up fire on this car and ends up killing this, this wife. I mean, innocent, like just this road rage incident. And then eventually, you know, they, they arrest this person, you know, put down the stop spikes, you know, down the road and stuff, but anything can happen. So what you're much better off doing is not teaching kids to be fearful of the world is, you know, as parents, why not say like, Hey, we're going to come along on, on this, this trip. And we're going to be chaperone this, and and we're going to come along. Um, so that's one. And then you get to go on the trip too. I mean, if that was offered to me, I'd be like, hell yeah! I haven't been to DC. Like, I'd go on this trip. Like, I would love to do that. Um, I think my daughter'd be all right with it too. Um, but yeah, I would. I would love to do that. And the other part is, you teach kids about situational awareness. All right. And and you you plan ahead of time, like here's where we're going to be. Um, if you identify anything, you know, that you're a little nervous about, like, you know, whereas a group like here's how to convey that you can get in contact ahead of time with with people that help you do tours. So that's another part, too, is like you could have raised a little bit of money here and, and there's someone to meet you on the other side. I, I did a lot of research on this. Like there are a lot of people who meet up with schools and then kind of help facilitate the tours and more or less. So it's efficient, not that it's safe um, because it's already safe, but you know, that it, that's, it's efficient, you know, that you're not trying to go to every single monument and every single place, um, you know, that that's, that's out there. You're maximizing, maximizing your time. Um, so yeah, I, I'm really, I'm really, uh, it, so, and here's the position. So the, the superintendent, Jim Paul, from that article that I, I talked about last week, I don't blame the superintendent. I, I, I don't blame the superintendent and the superintendent did a really tactful job of, of when he was interviewed by NPR, Lulu uh, Garcia Navarro, I mean, who actually did a really nice job interviewing. I mean, that was really well done on her part. And and his responses were very thought out and very tactful, although she kind of turned the tables on him at one point and said, well, what happened if this was a school attack? And he's like, well, what the hell? In his mind, obviously, he's like, we're talking about Washington, D.C. Like, now you're talking about school protocol. Um, but, you know, that's where everybody goes. So, but anyway, so, you know, he's being very tactful in this, not throwing the parents under the bus, the, you know, quote, unquote, of saying, this is a parent decision. I would have done it. You know, we, we wanted to do this. The teachers wanted to do it, but the parents said no. You know, he's very tactful saying parents have concerns and we need to respect those and whatever. Yeah, and I get those. And I'm sure that he presented the facts of saying, you know, here's the benefits of doing this and, and the procedures that they would use to, to ensure the safest possible experience as they could. Um, but there gets to be a point in that, in, in that where it doesn't matter how much research you bring in and whatever, it's not going to convince the people that are doubling down. The people who are just convinced of, okay, we had the October 1st Vegas shooting. We had the October 31st um, bike, you know, massacre of, of what, eight people, you know, by, by a vehicle jumping up on a bike, on a bike and um, walkway path. And then we have the Sutherland Springs. So it's like, no, we're not, we're not going to do this. And, and those are, those are three. And, you know, there could be others. Plus, you know, there are things that happen in Washington, you see in big cities all the time. But, you know, ah, oh, it's so, it's so frustrating. It is so frustrating because I understand that, again, the administrator's pr perspective of he's realizing pretty fast in this. I, you know, that he can't go any further. Like, it doesn't matter what research he brings out. And then even if he does that, 
And if anything happens, he now becomes 100% culpable for this because you know, he's basically vouching for the safety of these students, which you don't want to put yourself in. I mean, you can present the research, and but, I mean, if everybody's like, oh, this is great, but if anything happens, like, it's your fault, we'll fire you. Um, you know, so, so that's it. Um, but denying these kids, and not kids and staff, but denying these kids the opportunity to travel to Washington, D.C. because of this hype. And, I mean, I don't even know how the kids were involved in this. It's interesting because the story never had that. I went back, but, like, did the kids do a little research on D.C., like on violence in D.C., um, you know, just on a safety of school bus travel and, and things like that and, and, and just, like, how to stay safe and talking to other schools who have done trips to D.C., I mean, none of that was really talked about. Um, and, again, kids, um, and, and, again, you're talking eighth grade kids. So, you know, they're, they're going to be pretty, I mean, they're going to understand your directions. They're going to be pretty aware of what's going on around them. Again, you're out during the day with, with thousands of people with a heavy police presence um, in, a, in a tourism area. The likelihood is you're going to be fine, just as fine as if you took these kids to an end of the school year um, baseball game of the Cleveland Indians or something like that. So, um, so yeah, it, it, it's really something. And I, you know, we go back all the way to the war of the worlds where I think one of the most interesting things that comes out of, out of that study, which was, um, you know, again, which was a pretty thin study with not a, not a big, you know, big, number of participants, but the benefit that that had going for it definitely was that it was close to the event, so you didn't have the memory, um, the forgetting curve, and then also the conflation of memory. Um, but people, you know, some people will actually, I mean, they'll just flat out believe whatever they're told, and, and they'll flat out believe it, and if you try to present evidence to the contrary, or even try to inform the discussion a little more, they will shut you down. They will shut you down. And, you know, your voodoo research and whatever, they don't want any part of it because, like, oh, yeah, like all this research, but this still happened in Vegas or this still happened in Sutherland Springs, you know. So it's like trying to, you know, take it in a different context. It's like trying to say, like, um, you know, I built my house here, but it doesn't mean that the probability – it, you know, that there's going to be storm damage to my house over the next hundred years from some severe storm. I mean, probably it's going to happen. I mean, these things happen. This is the way. But you equip people then with the means to handle this. Like you equip kids and the adults of here's how to be aware of your environment. You can also get a guide, you know, to do the, this, you know, to help us out. But here's how to be aware of your environment, um, you know, and, and how to, to stay safe in in the setting um so yeah i boy i feel really i feel really i feel really bad for the the kids in that district outside of, of cleveland okay I, I i still i still feel bad like my eighth grade trip was literally to the neighboring community we went to tour the jail the county jail which was new um ironically the desk I have right now was the uh, sheriff's desk for Marathon County. So this was in the jail um, building when we toured it when I was an eighth grader. And uh, this is a massive, massive desk. Like, it's super solid. And my dad was on the county board, and they put these things up for, like, bid like they were just trying to get rid of them, so he probably got it for like ten bucks, and then he had a pickup truck, and then he got someone to load it up and haul it home, and it became mine, and I've had it, you know, for like thirty years, and I love it. Like I'll never get rid of it because you could never buy anything like this again. Like you could never buy a desk like this again. Um, so I absolutely love this desk. How the hell I got it downstairs, I'll never know. Like I'll I'll never know. I mean, there's no way I could do it now. I'd have to get someone to, to I'd have to hire somebody to like move this this thing i mean i don't think I, I couldn't lift it i mean it's just um you talk about duck and cover like you get under this desk you're safe so um but yeah that was like our that was our class trip you know 
was to this neighboring community, and, and I still remember it. I mean, it wasn't Washington, D.C. I remember we got to go to a Chinese restaurant, which we didn't have in our hometown, and um, that was pretty cool. That was the first time I really did that. And my friend Gerald bought like $20 worth of, of fortune cookies, which he didn't realize are actually made in the United States. But um, but that was really cool, you know, so we got to do do some of the – I remember that. Like that was a big thing. It wasn't D.C. D.C. would have been really cool. Um, and as an aside, like I did not try my first, um, taco until I was a junior in college, by the way, my roommates convinced me to go to Taco Bell against my will. Like I was arguing, like we gotta go to McDonald's. I don't know. I haven't gone to McDonald's in years, but like back then, and then like I had this beef burrito, not beef, steak burrito. And the moment, like I took the first bite, I'm like, oh, I'm in love with this thing. This is awesome. And uh, that was incredible, but like an experience, you know, I was doubling down because I was fearful because my parents really didn't ever make ethnic food. I mean, we were pot roast and potatoes, you know, so like a lot of this stuff was really new to me and not like Taco Bell is like ethnic food, but it's like a starter down that path. So, um, yeah, so I guess the takeaway is, the takeaways from today is one is Menards was a great place to work part time going through school. And I'm glad I did that. I've been listening to uh, DT and the Black Brigade. DT, please get a hold of me. I did follow you on Twitter, although I go to your website and there's absolutely no way to get a hold of you unless I'm totally missing it, which I, which I could be. And I'm not on Facebook. I have been for three years. I'm not going to get on Facebook. So, like, forget that. Um, and. So yeah, I'd love I'd love to talk to you. I'd love to have you on the show. Um, I think DTs are like from my generation, kind of like Aaron Clary. We're a lot like all guys, like kind of in our forties. So you know, we we understand what it was to grow up um, in the area uh, in the in the time of Saturday morning cartoons. Aaron recently talked about getting up and watching um, the Farm Report with his siblings before the Saturday morning cartoons came on. And I remember that. I remember watching the farm report before Roadrunner and Captain Caveman and Hong Kong Fui and all of those would come on TV. Um, yeah, the farm report. So, um, yeah. And, and I think also the fact of materialism um, and, and being careful with money, you know, like we're, you know, we, we have, I mean, I don't know. I have a lot of things right now, like, like knickknacks, I guess, around me. I mean, nothing like of substantial value. Like, this is a Mr. Meeseeks uh, pen that um, my daughter's got me for my birthday. Which I got to take this label off. That's crazy. It shouldn't be on here. Hi, Mr. Meeseeks. Look at me. I'm Mr. Meeseeks. Here's a pen. So, again, for those of you listening to this on audio, the show loses a little bit at this point. Um, but yeah, I I mean, and and there's so much that I re I remember taking out um, CDs, like saving up my my money from mowing, even my Menards money. Like you had some had to go to college expenses and paying your car insurance and and you know the the miscellaneous stuff with that. But I remember um, using my money. And I even saved money for my my assistantship in college, which wasn't much, and um, and taking out like CDs and, and bank CDs back then were pretty awesome. I mean, you get like seven, eight, nine, ten percent, and you could get a Ford interest note from Ford Motor Company, which was like a bank CD, of like ten like percent for ten years. I mean, stuff you could never get today, but it's pretty awesome. It wasn't that long ago, but I, I still have like the remnants of some of these things, like the little. You know the certificate stubs and stuff like that. So that was pretty cool. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's just not. A, it's so weird because one of the things in college, my uh, anthropology professor, Professor Moore, really cool guy, really cool guy. Um, he he talked about how um, he had inherited a number of toolboxes because of people just dying in his family, you know, like relatives, grandfathers, great grandfathers. So he's like, I've got like eight toolboxes downstairs and I don't know what to do with them. And my neighbor actually 
who's who's like my age kind of had the same thing like hey, we he had a st- garage sale you know the kind of city white garage sale a year ago and he put together like three four toolboxes of you know, just with random tools and out for sale for like not much like five ten dollars and some of them sold i don't think all of them sold um but he's like, I have no use for these things. Like, I've just inherited these over the year. Like, I have my years. I have my uh, the tools that I need. So, like, I, I have the same thing. Like, I've had relatives pass, and I've inherited their tools. And some of them, I don't even know how the hell to use them, but um, a couple of them I do. But I don't, I don't make things like I used to. Like, as you get older, at least as I get older, like, when I was younger and I moved into this house, like, I actually made doors. And, and I made a drawer. I designed out a drawer that I made to go underneath a a a work area in my garage, and um, this thing completely had like no rails. It was just a little um, paraffin wax to make it go in and out, and and this flat surface. And it totally looks like it belongs there. Like it it actually is designed like really really cool, and it works like a charm. Like it works perfect, flawless. I look at this thing. I'm like. Who the hell built this? Like, because today I don't think I could do it. And some of those things, too, are like when you're younger and you don't think you, no one has told you you can't do it, you can do it. And, like, I built a door, which I still have today, and which, like, closes super tight and seals up and everything like that. And, you know, all these things, like, I drywalled my garage, and my brother-in-law helped with that. But, you know, all these things, like, today, like, I would just kind of hire out to do because I just don't have the time. Time is money, and when you have kids, um... You know, I'm not going, especially like I have girls um, who are terrific, but, you know, if I had sons, maybe they would, they would want to engage in this a little bit more. My girls, not, <laughs> not so much, you know, it's kind of not their thing. Like, Hey dad, dad's going to patch up, you know, a little bit of drywall seam in the garage. Like, you know, that uncle Dan and I put up, uh, anyone want to help? Nope. Okay. I guess it's dad. So, um, but yeah, just, just, a, just crazy, you know, the, how the, how the times, how the times change. And, I, and so anyway, I'm going back. I got this toolbox, like from my great grandfather and he's got these tools. So I take them out and it's got like the, the drill, but it's all hand drill. So you take it and you like move it around and put the, and you can still put traditional drill bits in and you can drill holes and stuff. I'm like, this is really cool. Like I can imagine somebody building a barn with this, you know, in 1902, like I can read this could, this totally could have been done, you know, could have been used for that. But like, I have no use for it whatsoever. Like I have my power drill at a Makita that went to hell on me. So now I have a DeWalt, but, um, I would never use this thing, but yet, like, I'm not probably going to give it away because it's just like too coolly crafted. Like you could never get this today. And like, you know, the, the hand, planing stuff and stuff like that if i'm like but you know i've never used it like i've had this stuff for years like i've opened the toolbox just to inventory it once in a while and you know, like a plumb bob because like he used to build his own garage or his house or whatever the hell and i'm like a plumb bob to me. i mean i'm just not going to use these things so i don't know what to do with them it's really a dilemma so i'm thinking like do i hold these things for my daughters when they get married that maybe their husbands would have an interest because I just don't, my daughters just don't have this type of interest. Um, or, or do I try to get rid of them? But then like, you're really not going to get anything for them. But on the other hand, like, you know, um, I, there's no need to hang on to them. So if you get anything for them, I mean, you could use that for something that you want that you might use, like, you know, it's going to cost me a few hundred dollars to put new rims on my bike. Not that I can't afford that anyway, but um, I just don't know. You know, I, I, I just don't know what to do with these things. And even like I have all of these things around me right now, like I'm going to bring this over here. So, again, for those of you not watching the show, you don't know what you're missing. Okay. But because I have a sport cone on for one. All right. Um, and the signage is kick ass. But this is a, a, a bendable fireman, okay? And uh, so he's over here on the side. So, yeah, like, so, you know, it's cool because I was a firefighter. Um, but, like, I, you know, could I live without this? Yeah, I definitely could. I could, I could do without this. So he's going back over here, by the way. 
Um, and so I don't know. You know, I got all this stuff around me, and I, I need to clean up the office. I, and moving the stuff in the back um, last, well, not last week. I think it was Sunday. I got up early, and, and, and it's really cool because I have two really nice credenzas, and they're narrow. Or, or the, the, the depth is only like, I don't know, 14, 18 inches. So they're skinny credenzas. And I got them from a place I used to work at. They were upgrading their furniture. So they put the stuff out and you could bid on it, like the silent auction. I think I bid like 25 bucks on each and I got them. And then, um, one of the guys from work loaded them, pick up and brought them down with me in my basement. And they're great. Like you could, these things today cost you hundreds of dollars. And I mean, they were made like probably in the sixties, like they're super solid, like there's zero wear since they've been here. They're awesome. They don't take up a lot of space. Um, so I don't know where in the hell that story was going, but you know, um, it, it is, it is just so, uh, it, it, it's just so strange, you know, for, for me right now to process all of all this going on, you know, like with, with the media rhetoric. And again, I listen to podcasts, I download. Um, so I'm going to give you a kind of, kind of my podcast rundown right here. And first of all, I do have, I have some special guests coming up on shows and I'm kind of moving the mic around a little bit here. There's something not quite right with, I have a, um, you know, I've, uh, I've, I've got a special, um, I don't know what the hell it is, a shock mount for the mic. And, uh, so, you know, that works kind of well, but I, I, but it's not adjusting quite right. I don't know the keys you turn it, you know, the, the different, you turn the different, well, that just went bad. Oh no. All right. Kind of fixed. Anyway, I got to, I've got to bring a players down here and get a little more aggressive on this one key. But, um, so you're adjusting the, you're adjusting the keys on the, the, the mic. Actually, it's a road studio, studio arm. So it's really cool. But, um, yeah, again, this is the part of the show when it, it really, if you're hanging with me, hang with me because it's really starting to slide. But, um, anyway, um, you know, I, I really want to give a shout out to some of my favorite podcasts. And podcasts I think you should listen to. One is the Awareness Podcast, Awareness Pod. You can look it up on on Twitter or just go to awarenesspodcast.com. Hector Solis. Um, Hector is a, a terrific friend from the greater San Antonio area. And he is, he, um, a, I, I would say, an incredible journalism, um, you know, uh, expert. And, but it's not like his first career, like he does podcasting as a passion and he's very, very good at it was what well, it has an integral role in typical daddy podcast, but now is, is the lead in, in the awareness podcast has worked with, um, sex trafficking, uh, bullying to bring awareness to that really phenomenal, phenomenal work always from Hector Solis and just a top notch person. Hector was the one who contacted me. And, and said to me, Dave, I think like, um, I like your podcast. Like I've been listening to podcasts and, and, but your sound, your audio is not like, like good. So like, you know, here's what you want to do for settings on your mic. And here's some software that you want to use, which helped like greatly immensely. And he's just a class guy. And I am, uh, I am actually going to make it a priority to go down and to visit Hector. Um, within the next year or two, either individually or like with my family, because I do consulting all over the country um, on safety and expert witness stuff. But um, I need to get down and I need to I need to meet up with Hector and, and just uh, appreciation. He is a he's a phenomenal, um, helpful person and, and just, you know, Hector is the kind of person that just makes the world better. He's just a, he's a great person, and you listen to his podcast. And if you're a parent, it's really informative. It really helps you out. And boy, I mean, he's he he's top notch. Um, so thank you, Hector, and the Awareness Podcast. Um, Marion West um, and the Sustainable Living Podcast. So kind of going in a different spectrum of more like living a a lifestyle um, that is more in tune to mother earth, 
But you know, I I'm, I'm just going to say it. Like people might think, oh, it's like like this granola show of like what you should do, and you know, everybody should should make wooden clogs and you know, recycle you know rainwater and and stuff like that. You know, she's very very sensible in her show. Brings on a number of guests. She's she's phenomenal. Uh, works with Janice Fries, I believe, to co-host a number of her shows. But you're going to get some really fascinating stories out of out of her shows. And I've shared it once before, but once you know, she interviewed a a a man who was living with some relatives in a an apartment, and they were down to frying up bologna like for a for a meal. And he went outside the apartment and found some onions just growing wild and, and brought those in and, and used those as a garnish. And then kind of used that as a springboard to say, like, well, why can't I go to people and say, like, I will build, like, this garden in your yard and then I will maintain it. And if you let me take 75% of the crop, I'll give you 25% of the crop. Um, and then also teaching people like how to maintain and grow their own gardens and stuff and just, just really cool stuff and her own introspections. She's really in tune with, with life and with the pace of life. Um, so I really, really appreciate that readily random with Larry Roberts. Um, uh, Larry hasn't had a podcast come out for a little while. He does a ton of voiceover work. Um, but readily random.com and, and Larry gets on phenomenal guests. Like I look at his guest list and I, I was fortunate enough to be a guest, um, you know, and, and, but he has, has tremendous interviews. Larry's awesome. Readily random.com. Um, I, I've listened to Aaron Clary and, or Captain Capitalism and the Clary podcast. You can find that on SoundCloud. Um, or go to captaincapitalism.blogspot.com. I've listened to Aaron for, for years and, and all of his podcasts. Um, so I, I appreciate listening to Aaron and he's recently, um, uh, brought about, uh, an awareness for DT and the Black Brigade, uh, podcast. And, and I appreciate the intellectual aspects that, that I gain from that podcast. It's very entertaining. And the thing I don't understand about DT is like he takes a ton of sound clips and cuts them in like from movies or, I mean, he's really good. He's, he's really talented at this. And, and it's a lot of fun because he's, he's a very smart guy. Um, and I'm like, how do you not get flagged by YouTube? Like I, I pull up something like I use from audio blocks, which I paid for. And it's like, there's a claim on the national anthem that you have to dispute. I'm like, what the hell? Like this was on Audio Blocks. Now, thankfully, Audio Blocks is really great. Like you let them know, and usually, like in hours, it's resolved, it's done. Like there's never been a problem. But you know, he'll take stuff directly from movies and put them in. And I'm like, how are you still surviving without being tagged for, <laughs> for whatever? But I, I enjoy DT, so you can check out the. Um, I, I just think you, you you go into like theblackbrigade.org. He doesn't have a lot of followers. Um, which is kind of amazing. He just doesn't do a lot of promotion of himself. I, I think DT, I don't know for sure, but I believe he's an engineer um, in Minnesota. And and I, I just, again, I, I really, uh, I, I'm, I'm downloading a lot of his work. And I've just been familiar with it just as of recent. I didn't know it was out there. Stefan Molyneux, Free Domain Radio. Um, you know, it's entertaining. He, and, and Stefan gets a ton of downloads. Um, being myself an expert witness, uh, a legal expert witness, I understand the strategies, the techniques that Stefan uses sometimes to manipulate his guest. And one of the things is, um, he loves to get people on who are like-minded. Um, but with that said, he gets, he gets some really entertaining, uh, really informative guest, um, you know, intellectual, guest and then he'll also do call-in shows and it's a good listen and it's a good reflection but you can also see kind of the positionality where he will use a strong um register of of language and and his depth of philosophy to to kind of maneuver people into positions 
So it's one of those things where um, I, I guess you describe him as being more alt right, more aligned with like uh, um, Mike Cernovich. Um, but he he does definitely use use tactics um, on people who kind of challenge his his positions. But for that regard, I mean, I li- I listen to it for the entertainment factor more or less, um, and just to keep my mind open. And and I he is a he is a very dynamic speaker. It's going to be very engaging. Um, so I don't know if I've left anybody out really on my podcast, my, my favorite podcast list. Um, so if I did, I'm sorry, but again, um, Aaron Clary, uh, readily random, uh, black brigade with DT, um, sustainable living podcast, um, awareness podcast with Hector Solis. Uh, please check out all of those. Um, and, um, yeah, I, 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 you know, it's not going to be for everyone. You know, some of these shows are a little salty, too, and a little edgy. And I, I like that because I want to know um, different perspectives of the range of the audience that I'm trying to reach. And and that helps me a lot because you don't want to just talk to, to always like, like-minded like people. You want to know what people from different perspectives are are talking. And, and that's, that's the art of debate. You know, that's the art of debate, of knowing different perspectives um and I, I think by doing my my range of that that that's really helped me a lot um and and again you know the the people i listen to you know are they can have some very strong positionality they can be a little salty they can be a lot salty but they're not threatening harm to other people these are not people who are going to you know bring harm to anybody else these are people who are if you are I know out in, um, you know, Nevada or Utah and you have a flat tire and, and they're, they're motorcycle motorcycling by you or driving by you. Like they are going to stop and they're going to ask if you need help or they're going to help you or something like that. These are, these are people. Um, but these are also people who are probably going to, you know, you know, these, they're going to be carrying guns and going to protect themselves and all of that too. But they're, they're, these are these are genuine people who who are are looking out for, um, you, you know they're they're going to they're going to help their their fellow person you know in in need, um in in those situations like I notice you know again, um if you're stranded at the side of the highway and and, and you know something like that so, um, I am am just going to close here by a little bragging, a little bragging here from the safety doc. Um, this show's a little longer. So those of you who have a longer commute or you're, you're doing something longer, you know, but my oldest daughter and I, I had told her this for a while. I said, if you make the principal's list, so at her middle school, so in her grade, I don't, I don't know, a hundred and some kids in her grade. Um, but they have they have a principal's list and then they have like an A honor list and then I don't know if there's like an honor roll. But the principal's list is like the above and beyond. It's a handful of students. It's it's like maybe six, seven, eight students out of that hundred or hundred plus who have who have not only gotten A's but who have gone above and beyond in in being involved in clubs or additional assignments or have done assignments to such a level that it's gotten like an A plus type grade. And my daughter, my middle school daughter is extremely diligent, extremely organized. Like her room is super organized. Like her binders are organized. She's, she's very in depth. Like I think she taught herself German, you know, she, she's on the Khan Academy and she's, she's really she's really brilliant and she's, she's a great kid. And she also has like a super keen sense of humor, which I love because we can go into to like Walmart. This actually showed up like in, we're, we're in Disney and I could, at that time she was, she was 10. Now she's 11 and she could kind of start to play into my humor a little bit because you know, it shows up a lot. Um, and, but we were recently at Walmart and, and we're doing shopping and she says, um, so they have they have the bakery cart and it's like hey we made too much like you know whatever you know sconces or 
biscuits, whatever it is. And there was a single sock on the cart. And she goes, hey, Dad, they made too much sock. And she's kind of smiling. And I'm like, you know, I just thought it was so funny. Because obviously someone just put a sock there. And I'm like, yeah, if, you know, you think someone would be more precise, you know, making sock. You know, you make two socks. You always have a pair. You don't make, you know, don't make an extra sock. So, um, but just stuff like that. I, I really, I really appreciate that, that sense of humor. She made that principal's list. I'm very, very proud of her. Also proud of my younger daughter for, for, um, excelling, um, in her elementary school. But it is really cool. I'm I'm really proud of my my daughter for making that elite principals list because she's worked very hard at it. And um and, and you know I'm I'm excited for her as she goes down the her her career path. I mean eventually, but I mean the things that she's going to do, the places that she's going to go. You know, we've got some some trips planned, you know, for this upcoming summer um, that are going to be more cultural, and and that's going to be cool and, and stuff like that for the next couple of years. But um, she she's she's really really going to have some wonderful opportunities available to her. And she's such a, a she's a hard worker and she's a good person. And uh, and what can you really ask for? Um, if you're a parent and you have those, and, and you have those things, um, in your kids, I appreciate that. So you talk about Thanksgiving. Yeah. What are you thankful for? And I'm like, wow, you know, it really turned out, you know, the, the, my daughters really, really are great, are really great kids. Um, so I appreciate that. And I am going to, uh, wrap up this, this podcast. So again, we've got kind of the, we've got the new signage in back of us. We have sponsorship by Sprigio, and I do work with Sprigio on a, on a monthly basis, um, numerous times, and work with their specific client base. We're trying to do something right now of, of doing um, language samples and getting reading levels for how schools explain bullying and harassment to kids, especially middle school, because that's kind of like when it spikes statistically. Um, how they explain what the words are they're using to explain it. And then also the, the, the words, the terminology kids are using to report because what I'm finding in, in sampling reports and sampling some of the, these ways that, that schools are using to educate kids is, is they're using terminology that, that it's pretty sophisticated. Um, and, and some of this even is testing out like it in multiple reading levels is like a, is like a post high school level. And so I'm like, whoa, like we've got to really take a look at this because you're, you're, you're kind of designing this out more for you. Like when you're writing your reports versus like what the kids need to understand. So there's processes such as like an affinity process we're going to talk about in December of, of how to kind of get the language back down to where kids get a handle on it. Um, and it's, and you know, and it's not, it's not over their, their heads. So that's pretty exciting because I, I'd like to dig into the research side of that. So, um, yeah, I, I have a massive cleaning scheduled down here for this office. I'm going to kind of rip it all apart, except, you know, the back part that's been done, that's going to kind of stay. And, uh, I'm going to rip it all apart, clean everything up, kind of condense things down and, and, and kind of take it from there here in the next few weeks over the winter break. Um, did see the movie closing, did see the movie Coco. Coco, the movie doesn't really like fit the commercials. Um, I found it interesting. Uh, my my godfather uh, was from Mexico. He passed four years ago. A tremendous man. Um, so I learned more about like the Day of the Dead, which was like the whole movie was based upon this this Day of the Dead. And there were a lot of like weird things in the movie that like my daughters picked up on, like, so you'd light candles and you would put pictures out and, and so it's, you know, it's centered in Mexico and it's animated. And as long as you had a picture out and you remembered somebody and you like put their favorite food out in front of their picture, or whatever, they could travel back from the life of, or, or the world of, of being dead into the world of the living on, on the day of the dead. But if somebody forgot them, then they couldn't travel back and eventually everybody would be forgotten. 
But my daughter's brought up a couple points. Um, and this was good because my, again, my godfather is from Mexico and I think that this gives light into, um, some of his heritage and some of his, his beliefs. Um, but you know, one was the, the main character who I, I forget what his name was. Um, but he like was in the top of like the family house or building or whatever, because they, they made shoes and stuff and like he has his own shrine He's got, like, candles all over and stuff like that. And there's, like, wood all over the place. Like, the whole thing is just, like, rackety wood. And, like, my my daughters at night, they question her, like, you know, that, that was really dangerous. Because, like, he took off and he had these, like, candles going, like, hell yeah, like, I'm a firefighter. Like, that's dangerous. Like, you know, I'm thinking, and I'm watching the way this is setting up in the movie, and I'm thinking, they're going to burn this place down. Like, this place will burn down, they'll lose the pictures, and then that'll be, like, the end for why these people can't come back because their pictures are gone. Well, that didn't happen at all. Um, so, you know, that, that story was out the window. But, um, but yeah, it was interesting because then the other question, you know, from my daughters was, well, what if they didn't have pictures? Because, like, 200 years ago, they didn't have pictures. Like, photographs. Everything was a photograph. So, like, could you just draw a picture of somebody or, you know, like years ago, yeah, a painting of some, I mean, what was it? Would that count then? I mean, because, God, if I had to draw, like, a a drawing of my grandfather, I mean, he'd be, you know, a stick, fi- a stick figure holding some kind of concertina box. I mean, he was in the Concertina Hall of Fame. Awesome, awesome man. I am a horrible drawer. So, I mean, would that count? So, um, yeah, I, 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 I don't understand. So they brought those questions. I'm like, I don't know. I don't know how the hell this, this really works. I mean, so it was cool from a cultural aspect and I, I didn't feel it was op- op- oppressive or trying to like get across some points. I thought it was very educational because I didn't know what the day of the day, I don't even know when the day of the dead is exactly, but it was helpful from that regard. And I wish I wish the previews would have played that up a little more. And it did have kind of this weird scenario to like it, like it's a movie you'd watch once, but like I never would buy it. Like even if it's marked down like fifty cents in a bin at Walmart, I'd be like, yeah, no, you know, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna get it. Um, so I would place it above the Lorax, you know, definitely. I, I didn't really care for that movie. Um, and it was interesting, too, because before the movie came on, the animators came on. There were, like, three of them. And then they kind of did this, like, two-minute thing of, like, you know, we really hope, like, you you enjoy this. And there's this one scene, and there's, like, 80 million different, like, pixels of homes and stuff like that. And, you know, this whole thing that we did, and they give, like, a little glimpse of it. And then we, when you get to it in the theater, I mean, it looks cool. But to me, it didn't look any cooler than 1982 Star Trek or Wrath of Khan, like in some of that stuff. I mean, like, you just see so much of that now. Like, nothing, it didn't really stand out to me. Like, yeah, I guess it was well done. I'm not criticizing them, but it wasn't something that stood out to me of, like, I've really got to take note of, of this. Like, this was super awesome. So, again, I'm glad I, I went to see it, like, um, and it... I mean, and I've thought about it a little, a little bit, um, and I, I do think it, it, it was helpful in giving me some cultural, I, I wouldn't say competence necessarily, but some, some insight into what the Day of the Dead was, because I had no idea. And I, I mean, so I'm only using this one source right now of the movie. I mean, I guess I have to look more into it, um, but it, it suffices, you know, of, of what that, that really is. And I suppose I should be celebrating day of the dead because you know i'd like to see carlos again i have his guitar back here come on pick it up i've got a guitar in the other room we could do a little jam um so yeah coco um i would recommend it's very it's a very kid-friendly movie very appropriate um not freaky at all like but some of it you know borderline kind of made sense kind of didn't make sense i mean i think there's a discussion you'd want to have with your kids afterwards of like what did you get out of that what did you understand and and two like you know my daughters are very linear kind of like i am you know like the thing of like wouldn't there be a a high risk of fire like because of like leaving all these candles and stuff i'm like yeah like that's why we wouldn't do that 
And then, like, you know, these these logistical questions of, well, you know, um, you know, what if you didn't have a pitcher? Then would somebody forget you or or things like that? So, yeah. I mean, but there's all those, I, I don't know. It kind of gets into, like, the parables of the Bible and stuff like that. I, I guess, you know, what was it, Jonah and the whale? Well, Jonah really couldn't be inside the whale, but the whale is a, is it really a image of consumerism and stuff like that? I don't know. I don't know. But I am putting my Christmas list together. I told my daughters each, because they did, they did excellent in school, I, I did give them a, a set amount, not a high amount, but a set amount they could go in and, and pick something off Amazon and I have an order I have to place because I, I did order the new Zoom um, H4N Pro. So I'm going to be getting some better audio here for my field stuff. Um, and then I did let them order something for themselves as as a reward um, for their their really hard work in, in school. Um, and, yeah, so, so, that, so that's pretty cool. So... Uh, Thank you very much for listening. I know it's a longer show. This is going to be a good show to listen to, though, when you're on a longer commute or it's like, you know, hey, I got a long Christmas drive coming up, so I'm going to save this episode of the Safety Doc for the Christmas drive. Or I'm going to be, like, cleaning around the house or something like that or sorting out stuff. Or I'm going to be getting my taxes ready, which I have no idea how that's going to look for me because I I do have, like, the business so I get like 1099s and especially as an expert witness and consultant to business, you know, different corporations, stuff like that. So I have a really complex kind of tax situation, um, that could be simplified possibly by the, by the tax reform. On the other side, I'm not sure if how much it would be simplified, but like I already have to start at this time of year, kind of getting my tax stuff together. It takes that long. And, uh, yeah, so. Um, I told my wife, like, it, I'm pretty simple as far as like things that, that I want. Like, I'm like, I need to replace like my socks. And when I replace socks, like I do it all at once. I have like smart old socks because like, I, I'm not trying to mix and match like a sock that's like three or three years old with a sock that's not. And I don't replace socks that often, but I do like, I love smart wool and because I wear them so much, but like, yeah, they're, they're kind of gone bad after so many after so many years, I do have to do like an upgrade here. So if I was at Walmart, hey, they made too much sock. I could buy one. I could buy one, one sock. Um, anyway, thank you so much for listening to the Safety Doc Podcast. You are a special audience. I appreciate you all very, very much. I sincerely mean that. Please share this show. Um, please comment. Please follow. You can follow on um, YouTube, you can subscribe. We're up to 24 subscribers. I appreciate that. We're up around 1600 now on Twitter, which is awesome because we're at 300 in March. And, you know, I do go in and I, I monitor that. So like if I'm getting followed by just people who are trying to sell me stuff, like I get rid of that or some goony things like, like that. So it's, you know, it's genuine. I'm getting genuine followers. We do have some great guests coming up. Um, Danny Woodburn, you know, who was on seven, seven episodes of Seinfeld is going to be on the show. Casey Kramer, fullback in the NFL, is going to be on the show, um, booking out with uh, Justin Dooley. And we've got some really cool stuff, like really fun stuff kind of planned for that show. And we've got to figure out if we're going to do that one in person or if we're going to do that one off of off of Skype. I think it would be better in person. I, I just don't know how we would, we're would we going to coordinate that. We'll get that put the, together, though. Um, and, and, yeah. Thank you so much for following the show. You can subscribe on SoundCloud. Now that SoundCloud's kind of come out of, you know, this like could be bankrupt or whatever. It seems like they got an infusion of cash. Aaron Clary's on SoundCloud. Like a couple of my my stalwart podcasters are still on SoundCloud. So I'm going to stick with SoundCloud for a while. Um, and then, I mean, I really never had a big issue with SoundCloud. The analytics aren't that great, but. I, I guess I don't really care because, I mean, by the time you plug things into Apple iTunes, which doesn't tell you anything, or Apple Podcasts and the other stuff, it, you know, I, I can go into my website and kind of figure out the, the traffic I'm getting there and just, like, the people that contact me, and that's pretty regular. Um, 
So thank you so much, um, at Safety PhD. If you can follow, I'd appreciate it, at Safety PhD. If you can get into YouTube and subscribe, I appreciate that. If you can get into SoundCloud and subscribe, Apple Podcast, that helps me. If you can get in, make a review, um, that really helps. That really helps. I, I love doing the podcast. This is Podcast 53. Um, and, again, we've done an upgrade here in the studio. And we will have some brand new um, audio equipment with the H4N and hooking that up with, um, you know, my newer my newer video cams. So we're going to have some new shots. We're going to be able to go on location and get some really good audio and and some things like that too. So I'm excited. I'm excited about that. So um, just the takeaways from today again. Remember, um, uh, people who do not make attempts to check what they're told or check the stories. Those are the people who experience the most fear and they're more likely to double down on their positions. So if that's you by nature, think twice, okay? Twice, thrice, force, fifes. I mean, think, think, okay? Inform yourself, take the time. You can get out there to Drudge Report and get out to, um, other reputable sources, writers, I think, rooters, whatever. But um, do that, do that, definitely do that, and and take the time. Yeah, um, don't make decisions right away. You can go into journ.org, j-u-r-n.org. It's a research site. Now a lot of you are like, God, Dave, I'm not going to do the research. Well, but but I mean, you can go in there. You can uh, Google Scholar. I think is is kind of useless because you can go into Google Scholar and find things and then like it'll be like here's the first three paragraphs pay us $25 if you want the rest of it but that's not the way Jern is Jern you're going to get some articles and you, and you can pick out um, research articles or, or narratives or stuff like that um, so yeah just kind of get your information and and balance yourself out because I think it can bring I think what I'm telling you can decrease the anxiety in your life. I honestly believe that because it's done that for me. And people will ask me, too. They'll be like, Dave, you're, you're so close to this stuff. You know, like you work with the police and fire and EMS and as a critical instant debriefer and stuff like that. And and does this stuff in like in high high intensity legal cases, like literally, literally in a legal case, I went through 17,000 pages 17,000 pages of depositions of police reports of other documents which it, and that wasn't all that was involved in the case but I had 17,000 pages that I went through and this is the kind of stuff we go through and it's like line four you know word five on page whatever I mean it's really super super thick stuff that you're going through um, but you know, learn how to go through material, learn how to cross check and make up your own mind. And again, debate is a lost skill. Bring that back. And I know it's hard. So let's say like you're a parent in this district outside Cleveland and you're listening to me right now. And you're like, you know, Dave has some good points on this thing. Like maybe we should reconsider this Washington DC trip. But like the other side is like you, you you don't want to be the only person that stands up and says we should reconsider this, and all the parents are like, get out of here, put your house up for sale, like we're not going for it. So you also have to know your context and situation. So um, those things get really hard. But I I just want you to understand, you know, debate has been around since the time of Aristotle, and and debate is not argument. Let's not let's not conflate confuse those terms. Um, debate is understanding. It's being informed about other positions. So again, if we get into like this DC trip, this whole thing with this DC trip, um, it's it's being open to the the statistical side of things um, of saying you know if we do if our, if our eighth graders do take a trip to DC. And, you know, the probability of, of being um, a fatality in a bus accident is the pretty much the identical probability of, of being killed in, in D.C. 
Um, and both those are extremely, extremely small. Um, but what the benefit is, you know, when it, I know this is getting long, okay, but I, I'm hoping it's still interesting. There was, it's on YouTube, I think it's called Mississippi River Adventures. I don't know. I could, I could load it up here, but, um, there were two brothers. They were from Portage, Indiana. Two brothers. And they posted a couple of years ago and they did a, they were in college. So these guys are like probably early, very early twenties. And they, they, they went to the start of the Mississippi River and they worked their way all the way down close to the Gulf of Mexico and their dad picked them up. And they, they did like this video journal of their daily experiences. And you could tell, you know, like they're burning calories or losing weight. It's frustrating. They're having to learn, like when you get the locks, like how to, to get the attention of the lock person. So they lower the water and let you in. And then the, the good times, you know, when things are great, the times when it's raining and it sucks or people are running up beside you and trying to get wakes to tip your canoe over or, you know, you're staying in a, uh, you know, alongside a river and there's other people there and they're really being noisy. And you're not getting sleep. And when your can opener pukes out on you and you have to like go to a local town. And, but then they also have like the whole side too, of like the generosity, like the people you meet or someone who like picks you up and they'll say like, here, let me throw your boat in the back of my pickup truck and take you across this, this dam area onto the other side. Or like, let me, let me pay for your meal at a local restaurant and stuff like that. But the growth that these kids had um, in this experience, and I think that's, you know, and I'm thinking back to, like, if I were their parents, you know, these two, two, two guys, you know, maybe like, you know, ages, you know, 20, 21, 22, um, I would let them do it. I would let them do it. I mean, and, yeah, there's big risk involved in that. Like, you know, you, you could you could – drown, you know, you can be a, a victim of, of theft, something like that. You could be hit by a, a boat, whatever. Um, uh, but the other side was look at, look at that experience. Like look at that story they can tell now. Look at the reconnaissance they did. They talked about, you know, what it was like going through the St. Louis area and just that they found their own internal breaking points and strength and, and, so much of the, these are stories that they will tell as long as they live and to not have done that experience and how the experience will be a footing as they go forward in life is, is just incredible. It, it's just incredible. So like, I, I really love that. It's, I think it's Mississippi river adventures. I don't know if it's out there anymore, but it's two, it's two young guys from Portage, Indiana. And they would do again, like little video things like of every day, of maybe like 20 minute segments and they were always, you know, kind of entertaining. And sometimes you could tell like they were energized sometimes they were like dead tired. But, um, but yeah, I think that whole reconnaissance aspect again, Aaron Clary has this book reconnaissance man and I reviewed it on Amazon. So my review is up there, but reconnaissance man totally would not be endorsed by these, these collective parents from Cleveland. Um, and, you know, Reconnaissance Man is more about getting out and seeing the world or more or less even your country and, and areas that you might want to live and areas that you might want to go to school and, and, and things like that. So um, just I, I think there's a lot that comes to play here. So um, I, I, again, I appreciate all of you. Thank you so much. Uh, we're still in this warm weather phase in Wisconsin. It's it's strange um, because I haven't brought up the sleds or the snow tube or anything like that for my daughters. And it's almost December 1st. I mean, by the end of the week, it'll be December 1st. Um, and I feel, you know, I guess I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to get into the global warming debate or anything like that. But um, last year we only had... You know, probably we have a we have a sledding hill literally a hundred feet in back of our house, like it goes into parkland and sledding. We're, we're very fortunate that way, um, and we were only able to get out, you know, maybe five six days. Um, so you know, we'll take advantage of that as we as we can, and um, 
it, it's it's just it's it's really it's really strange. It's it's really strange because I grew up. I told a story today to a coworker, and I said I remember right around Thanksgiving, um, we had friends who were part of a snowmobile club, and they had a fundraiser, a chili dinner in the basement of a church, and it was a rural church. And we would have to drive out there. I lived again in central Wisconsin. And I remember and this was like right around Thanksgiving. It'd be like right after Thanksgiving. So, you know, about this time of year, maybe a week, week later, like first week of December, whatever. But um, we would drive out and I was, you know, 13, 14, whatever. But my, my parents would drive out to this rural church and there would be this is really great, always chili dinner, but the snow would be so high because the big V plows would come through. And this stuff would be literally like, you know, 10, 12 feet under the power lines on both sides of you. I mean, you drive through, you could see nothing except snow. I mean, these, these piles were huge. My first job, um, my office on the first floor, um, this was out, you know, in central Wisconsin, my office the snow was higher than the first floor. It was all the way up to like part of second floor because it would it would it would come across a field, and like all my windows and stuff were all covered up with snow. I mean, it's just crazy. But um, you know, so we're talking what you know, easily ten, twelve, fifteen feet deep on one side. But um, but yeah, it was it was just incredible. You know, this this amount of snow as we would go out to this chilly dinner. I'll never forget that because I actually thought at some points you could stand on top of this and probably reach up and touch a power line, which would be poorly advised, by the way, to, to do that. Um, and these, these massive V plows that would come through and, and, to, and to plow these roads. And we had rear wheel vehicles back then, you know, so you had to really be careful. And, and um, yeah, it, it, just, just a different time. And now, you know, none of that, none of that, none of that whatsoever. So I don't know if I'm glad that I lived through that or not, because I wasn't a big winter person. I did have a snowmobile, which sucked. It was a ski whiz, W-H-I-Z, a ski whiz made by Massey Ferguson. And this thing was like, you know, like a 2,000-pound snowmobile. I mean, it wasn't that much, but it was like a tank that was a snowmobile. Horrible gas mileage, completely unreliable. The track would come off of it. I'd have to drag it home after the track came off. So, like, trying to drag a snowmobile, like, home, I mean, I did it. Um, and eventually I got, you know, a three-wheeler, and, and, you know, they allowed those on a snowmobile trail. That was pretty fun. I mean, I had a blast with that. But, um, but yeah, I mean, like, they don't even open the snowmobile trails anymore because you, the rivers don't freeze over. So you can't, you can't go across, you know, the rivers. And, and I mean, right now, so what? It's like almost December 1st. And if you open and groom the trails, I mean, what do you, at the very best scenario, what are you going to get? Like eight weeks where you previously were getting, you know, maybe 12, 14 weeks of, of trail time. So I, I just think like snowmobiling, stuff like that's going to kind of be gone. It's going to be kind of a, be in the past. Um, and honestly, like, had I had my bike not put away this last week, I would have taken my bike out for a ride, uh, which would have been the latest in the season I would have would have been able to do that. And it probably wouldn't have been, like, the best ride. I mean, it was kind of warm. It was in the 60s, and it was a little bit, you know, breezy, which I don't care for when I bike. But, I mean, I, I still probably would have biked. So this is the Safety Doc wishing all of you the very best. Um. It's exciting. I'm helping my girls. We're kind of picking out, you know, Christmas presents for mom. And I don't know. I really haven't helped the girls pick out Christmas presents for each other. I guess I have to do that. I'm always more of like that they don't have to get me anything, but they still do. But they get me stuff like I'll use like notepads or, excuse me, like pens. I grade papers for my college classes I teach, purple pens. So, you know, stuff like that, which is which is cool. I appreciate that. So, um, take care. This is safety. Act. This has been a longer one. I think it's been a, been a good show though. I think it's been a good show and I do look forward to, um, 
I, I, again, I, I am very thankful for all of you. Have a, a very safe travels here um, as you start to visit family around the holiday season. And, uh, and, and please, please take care. Do not, the, the parting part here, the parting part, the parting part, 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 and a part. But the parting words of wisdom, do not just take one source as your, like, this is the information and this is what I'm going by. Fact check it. Validate it against one or two other sources or bounce it off some other people or do whatever and be open and, and allow yourself to be informed and not double down. Because we're we're dealing right now with a generation that's doubling down. And the problem with that, obviously, is, is you close yourself off to empirical research and you end up making, I think, uninformed or under-informed, incompletely informed decisions, which end up um, really depriving youth and possibly even yourself of, of some really tremendous opportunities in the greatest country on the face of the earth. So um, bless all of you. Thank you for listening to the Safety Dad Doc podcast. I'd love to hear from you. I'd love to have you as a follower. This is David signing out, soldiers. Thank you so much. <laughs>